The Poverty of Theory by E.P. Thompson, part three, and I think probably the last part. Fourteen. First, let us return from the vulgar, vulgar sociology of ideas to theory and its pure discourse of the truth. Let us revisit the orary for last time. Let us not only admire its part, but also notice, or its parts, but also notice the parts with which it is not supplied. Althusser's eviction of humanism and moralizing in For Marx was somewhat brutal. So he returned to the theme with renewed sophistication in reading Capital, The Real World. The real world, the gross manifestations of the obvious, the unpurified concepts of generalities one, these epiphenom epiphenomena would lead us, unless guided by theory, into a world of maya, illusion. The text of history we remember is the inaudible and il illegible notation on the effects of a structure of structures. Beneath all, we will find la structure à dominante. The theory of capital is the theory of a mode of production. And what Marx studies in capital is the mechanism which makes the result of a history's production exist as a society, hence producing the society effect which makes the result exist as a society. We are beginning to suspect, even if it is only because of the works of contemporary ethnology and history, that this society effect differs with different modes of production. Moreover, this society effect is made up of other lesser effects, the knowledge effect for theoretical practice, the aesthetic effect for aesthetic practice, the ethical effect for ethical practice, etc. The search for each of these specific effects demands the elucidation of the mechanism that produces it. This mechanism will be found within the structure of the mode of production. On two occasions, on these two crucial pages, Althusser proudly flourishes what he supposes to be his license of authority. That sentence from The Poverty of Philosophy, which we have found out to be in fact a court order to put his dog down. Thus, society, social formations are effects of the structure of a mode of production. Capital also enables us to understand the partic particles of which this structure is composed. It defines for the capitalist mode of production the different forms of individuality required and produced by that mode according to functions, of which the individuals are supports in the division of labor in the different levels of the structure. Of course, even here, the mode of historical existence of individuality in a given mode of production is not legible to the naked eye in history. Its concept, too, must therefore be constructed, and like every concept, it contains a number of surprises, the most striking of which is the fact that it is nothing like the false obviousness of the given, which is merely the mask of current ideology. Even if we allow ourselves to suppose for a moment that we are offered here an astounding insight which demystifies the false obviousness of the given, and takes us directly to essential truths illegible to the naked eye in history, it is difficult to know how our devastating insight can be, as it were, spoken. Let us suppose that, at a certain conjuncture, there is a moment within the society effect which gives itself to history's naked eye with the false obviousness of a shop steward saying to his fellow workers, Hey lads, the production manager is coming to the canteen today to give, to give us a pep talk on measured day work. Let's give him a hot reception. In order to demystify these sentences and construct them within theory as rigorous concepts, we must verbalize them thus. O Traeger of proletarian productive relations, the Traeger allotted a dominant function within bourgeois production or productive relations it will manifest itself in the canteen at this overdetermined conjuncture through the mechanism of a relatively autonomous ethical effect 
determined in the last instance by the law of motion of capitalist production relations. At the level of the intensified ac extraction of surplus value from the labor power of the proletarian trigger. It is determined that this conjuncture shall manifest itself in the form of a hot contradiction. It will be seen that we have successfully reduced the shop steward's ideology to science, with the exception of two words. Canteen is irredeemably polluted with the obviousness of tact and tact uh, or of act and hot is an irreducibly moralistic invasion so that these words must be contained within inverted commas lest they should contaminate the adjacent scientificity of the text it will also be seen that demystification has necessitated the use of 84 words in place of 27. this is very generally the case but it is a small inconvenience to accompany the attainment of revolutionary rigor. No doubt at all, demystification of such devastating clar clarity, if practiced within the heart of the productive structures as a political praxis, philosophy at class struggle will detonate the whole capitalist order. I cannot understand why, why the Alfusarians are waiting. Why don't they hurry down to Dagenham or Longbridge and try. But no reports of such praxis have yet come back to me, and for this there would be some theoretical reason, and an even more rigorous post althusserian let us say, a Hind Hindesian Hurstian, will detect this by a scrupulous symptomatic reading of Althusser's decidedly not innocent text. For under this scrutiny, the shop steward, and indeed the whole sentence, can be exposed as a pseudo-problem, as an abjectly ideological intrusion. This is given away in the very first word, the vocative O. For this is to smuggle back into theory both historicism and moralism by allowing us to suppose that the workers are subjects, that they can intervene as men in history. But the situation alluded to in these sentences is in fact a society effective contradiction within the mode of production. This effect is already inscribed within productive relations and requires no imaginary interpolation of, vo of vocatives and subjects. We may relax in our chairs. We may even doze since contradiction will continue to manifest its effects as shop stewards. There's no need to go down to Dagenham after all. This has been a vulgar, even empiricist response. Let us resume our exposition. <clears throat> Humanism, Althusser argues, is the heresy which introduces men as agents or subjects in their own history by an underhand reduction, by treating the relations of production as mere human relations. Um, this is an Althusser quote. History then becomes the transformation of a human nature, which remains the real subject of the history which transforms it. As a result, history has been introduced into human nature, making men the contemporaries of the historical effects whose subjects they are. But, and this is absolutely decisive, the relations of production, political and ideological social relations, have been reduced to historicized human relations i.e. to interhuman, intersubjective relations. This is the favorite terrain of historicist humanism. Althusser entertains for anthropology a malice even fiercer than that which he entertains for history. The notion of man making his own nature is one which a horde of cultural anthropologists have adopted. Even Marx is convicted of relapsing from time to time into a latent anthropology a naive anthropology given in the hidden assumptions of political economy. Balabar is honest enough to allow that, again and again, Marx and Engels afford support for the idea that it is men who make history on the basis of previous conditions. But who are these men? The concept of men constitutes a real point where the utterance slips away 
towards the regions of philosophical or commonplace ideology. The obviousness, the transparency of the word men, here charged with every carnal opacity, and its anodyne appearance, are the most dangerous of the traps I am trying to avoid. I shall not be satisfied until I have eliminated it as a foreign body. One trouble with this mode of theoretical practice is that an untutored and Protestant mind keeps slipping away into wholly irrelevant reflections. For example, at carnal opacity, I fall into a reverie and wonder with whether Mr. Balabar also came to intellectual maturation within the Jeune Étudiant Catholique. And then, by random association, I recall that Stalin served his own intellectual apprenticeship in a seminary of the Greek Orthodox priesthood. And then, since I am a fussy stylist, I wonder whether eliminated as a foreign body might not be improved when we consider the anodyne concept of men by the verb to liquidate. For if we think about persons in a certain way, it becomes more easy to enact our thoughts. If we think about women as dolls or pieces or chicks or whatever, it may be more easy to behave to them in this way. Some women may even think themselves so. If we think about men as the trigger of structures or of their actions as unjustified disturbance systems, then the thought will guide the act. As those lofty theoretical practitioners, the Daleks used to say, when confronted by men, exterminate. This reminds me once again of anthropology, for Althusser became involved for a moment in chapter seven of Reading Capital in an interesting argument. He stood back and confronted, as I have earlier done, political economy as an object, as a structure. And he found, as I think correctly, that political economy is based upon a prior definition and delimitation of a given field of activities. But to generalize from these activities and to assert claims for itself as a universal or fundamental science of society, there must be, within political economy, an, ul an ulterior assumption, and this can be located in the concept of need. For need is what I have called a junction concept, in this case between economics and anthropology. It will be seen that I am not following Althusser's words, but clarifying them and putting them into some order. He then discovers that classical economics is founded on the presupposition of a naive anthropology, which founds all the acts involved in the production, distribution, reception, and consumption of economic objects on the economic subjects and their needs. Thus, need is defined in such a way, self-interest, that its conclusions are entailed in its premises. All basic human needs are economic ones, as defined by political economy. Therefore, political economy is the basic science of society. What then would seem to follow? It might seem that Marx in shattering bourgeois political economy would liberate anthropology, or at least provide a precondition for its liberation in freeing need from definitions imposed by bourgeois and utilitarian convenience and permitting anthropology to investigate needs larger needs larger resonance. But not at all. As we enter chapter eight, we find that the theoretical pretensions not of bourgeois political economy, but of anthropology have been shattered by Marx's analysis. Marx is now offered to us as a Dalek, rushing down upon anthropology and crying out, exterminate. But if we exterminate the very presupposition upon which political economy is founded, if we take away from economics its support in need, then it would seem to rest on a vacancy. Did Marx find a better concept of need, a better anthropological basis? Not at all. An anthropological basis becomes therefore purely mythical. Needs are not economic, they are defined by the economic. They are subject to a double structural determination. Needs are assigned their content and meaning by the structure, um, by the structure of the relations between the productive forces and the relations of production. 
They are not only assigned their content, but also their meaning as economic. For to be economic is not to be economic in a vulgar, common sense way of being concerned with economic needs. It means occupying a certain space, a certain function to which la, la structure dominante assigns a meaning according to the modulation and flux of her mode of production. To construct the concept of the economic is to define it rigorously as a level, instance, or region of the structure of a mode of production. Um, here's an Althusser quote. The economic cannot have the qualities of a given, of the immediately visible and observable, etc., because its identification requires the concept of the structure of the mode of production. Because its identification, therefore, presupposes the construction of its concept. The concept of the economic must be constructed for each mode of production. End quote. This maneuver solves, or should we say dissolves, a number of difficult problems which have bothered historians and anthropologists for decades into a single wet theoretic theoretical pabulum. Kinship in primitive societies is the level, instance, or region to which the structure has assigned the economic. Military and political dominance is the economic instance in feudal society, and so on. Need in one case may appear as the need for seven wives, and in another case as the need to behead a traitor to his oath of fealty. But both are economic, and we certainly have no need of any anthropology to decipher either. Moreover, what could be more abject than the ideological illusion that men and women might participate subjectively, at any level whatsoever, in the definition of need? For they are traeger, supports of structures within which needs are assigned. I am becoming tired and my mind has slipped off once again. For all that Althusser has done in exterminating anthropology is to throw need back upon the bosom of la structure à dominante, so that not one part or region of her totality, but her whole person, is subjected to the gross utilitarian embraces of the economic. And I recall a critique of the utilitarian concept of need presented at the enunciation of the capitalist mentality in the words of one great proto-Marxist, King Lear. O reason, not the need, our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs, Man's life is cheap as beasts, but for true need, you heavens give me that patience, patience I need. Patience is very certainly our first need if we are to reason with Althusser. I will be patient, but for a last time. I will look once more at the concept of Traeger. I will argue it through. And then the scrutiny of the orary is done. The fullest statement is thus. Um... Authors are quote. The structure of the real, the, sorry, the structure of the relations of production determines the places and functions occupied and adopted by the agents of production, who are never ever, who are never anything more than the occupants of these places, insofar as they are the supports of these functions. The true subjects, in the sense of constitutive subjects of the process, are therefore not these occupants or functionaries are not, despite all appearances, the obviousness of the given of naive anthropology, concrete individuals, real men, but the definition and distribution of these places and functions. The true subjects are these definers and distributors, the relations of production and political and ideological relations. But since these are relations that cannot be thought within the category subject, end quote, the errors with which this argument is littered are so elementary that we need only indicate them one by one. First, there is the confusion of the notion of structure with structuralism. Structures, social, economic, conceptual, are not a discovery of the last two decades with a lonely forerunner in Karl Marx. As soon as we talk about organization or organism, about system, about the laws of supply and demand, or about institutions and about functionaries, 
we are talking about structure, and we are likely also to be talking about the ways in which human behavior is ruled, shaped, ordered, limited, and determined. This notion and the theoretical and empirical exploration of these structures have been with us for many generations. So far from being a revolutionary notion, it has been quite often, when pursued by practitioners to the ultimate of theoretical rigor, a profoundly conservative one, since it tends to see men and women as fixed in stations, on ladders of rank, subject to laws, of Smith or of Malthus, allocated rules or as moments of conformity or deviance within an, an, an ulterior consensus. This is in no sense, sorry, this is in no sense to argue that the notion is untrue or reactionary in itself. Although when pushed illegitimately from structure to structuralism, it always is both. It is simply a reminder that Althusser here, as elsewhere, is simply reproducing in Marxist terminology notions long sanctified within orthodox bourgeois disciplines, although some of his followers do not seem to have found this out, or do not yet seem to have found this out, the notion of men as traeger, or carriers of functions allocated to them by the market, laws, or simply a demand which were even, or sorry, or supply, and demand which were even moralized as divine, was at the very heart of vulgarized bourgeois political economy. During Marx's lifetime, this ideology sought exactly to impose this structure upon the working class, and at the same time to convince them that they were powerless to resist these immutable laws. And much of the history of the British working class in these decades can only be understood as a heroic, even moralistic refusal to be produced to being supports of the reasons and necessities of capital. When Marx refers at one point to the laborer as the bearer of living labor, it is in the context of exactly such a discussion of the alienation of the productive powers of social labor as the property of a stranger and as subject to the anti-humanist requirements of capitalist production. It is entirely different in the factories owned by the laborers themselves, for instance, in Rochdale. When Marx, in his well-known comment in the first preface to Capital, disclaimed making any judgment on individual capitalist, capitalists, it was because, from my standpoint, from which the economic formation of society is viewed as a process of natural history, individuals could be seen not as malevolent, and not respon and responsible agents, but as the personifications of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations and class interests. But this was to view persons as they appear in the domain of political economy, i.e. as they were continually being viewed within orthodox apologetics of the age. So that Marx was writing with his tongue firmly in his cheek and striking a preemptive blow against his critics by borrowing the rhetoric closest to the hearts of every exploiter who could exonerate himself as being the trigger of economic laws. Thus, as always with Althusser, we are offered an ideological penny, greasy with bourgeois use, and told that it is Marx's gold. That penny's twin is still being passed every day in Parsonian and structuralist functional systems behind Althusser's definition and distribution of places and functions. With all its italicized rigor, we find the Smelserian social system. Behind Treger, we find roles. And behind Althusser's grotesque notion of ideological interpolation or healing, we find even more chic notions of men and women, except of course, select intellectuals, not thinking or acting but being thought and being performed. All these exalted thinkers, bourgeois or Marxist, proceed from the same latent anthropology, the same ulterior assumption about man, that all men and women except themselves are bloody silly. 
Second, there are two trivial and furtive sleights of hand in Althusser's argument, which can only deceive an audience hand-picked from the lumpen intelligentsia. A. Althusser tried to take out another license of authority by gesturing at Marx's theoretical rupture with Fauerbachian man. Uh, the human essence, of course, as any first-year student finds out, in rejecting abstracted and generic man, Marx rediscovered men and women within the ensemble of social relations, within societies structured in class ways, and within empirically observable conditions. As a matter of fact, it is a question, and a very difficult one, how far Marx and Engels ever did fully reject the concept man, which reappears in the concept of alienation, in the notion of a truly human morality, and in what some scholars detect as an historical teleology of human imminence. I mention this question, which I cannot turn aside for now, and which has been exhaustively discussed by others, only to note that Althusser blocks and dismisses, as lapses, immaturities, surviving after the epistemological break, theoretical problems manifestly present in Marx's writing, which other critics have found to be either fertile or severely disabling. My immediate concern is only to notice that Marx and Engels in their major investigations dislodge the concept man in order to return to empirically observable real man. B. The other sleight of hand is the same trick performed backwards. Humanists and all anthropologists return to the concept man by treating the relations of production as mere human relations i.e. reducing these to historicized relations, to interhuman, intersubjective relations. This trick could only be passed upon an audience innocent of all knowledge of both history and anthropology, and it is disturbing that a practice of this kind could attain to academic reputability. I am by no means endorsing all sociology, all historiography, nor all that has been produced by the horde of cultural anthropologists. In fact, some practitioners within these disciplines are reducing men and women to traeger of structures as happily as Althusser, but scarcely a soul among them will be found to be commencing with the proposition of a human essence, nor making their object of study individual men, in intersubjective relations as against society. Their objects of study may include kinship systems, inheritance practices, demographic norms, value systems, social structures, political institutions, class relations, ideological forms, symbolic modes, consensual rules. The social sciences today are the products of a methodological revolution, one of whose initiators was Marx. It is precisely their structural preoccupations which place their feet upon the glissade which leads to structuralism, and which prepare their novices for Althusser's embrace. The third elementary error is to confuse the findings of particular analytical disciplines with the truth about the total phenomenon from which the procedures of that discipline have selected only relevant evidences. I have argued this already and with particular reference to political economy. This discipline defines its own field of inquiry and selects its evidence in accordance with these definitions, and its findings are relevant within the terms of this discipline. Everyone knows this. We do not turn to Ricardo for an explanation of Socinianism. In a certain kinship system, a wife's brother's second cousin, a wife's brother's second cousin may be understood within the discipline of anthropology as a certain point within a structured set of relations, and this as metaphorically a bearer of those relations. And in exactly the same way, a capitalist may be viewed as a bearer of capitalist productive relations. The discipline has already decided that we define this person so that this second cousin or this capitalist may be defined quite differently within other disciplines, may be viewed by a wife or by his own workers 
in quite different lights, does not or need not invalidate the findings in question. Theoretical practitioners are often to be observed in small, intense groups interrogating categories, but because of their empirical blockages, they are incapable of interrogating the point in society or history where these categories intersect. Instead of interrogating a category, we will interrogate a woman. It will at least be more agreeable. We will suppose this woman to be the wife of one man, the mistress of another man, the mother of three children of school age. She is a clothing worker and shop steward. She is treasurer of her local, local labor party. And on Thursday evenings, she is a second violin in an amateur orchestra. She has a strong constitution, as she must have. But she had a mildly neurotic, depressive disposition. She is also, I nearly forgot, a member of the Church of England and an occasional com communicant. As you will see, she is kept very busy. Viewed in a certain light, she is at she is a point at which a number of structures intersect. When these get on top of her, her depression sometimes takes the form of staying in bed so that she cannot fulfill her other roles. The psychiatrist sees her as being determined in her behavior by structured neurosis. But she is not overdetermined. Her constitution, material basis, is sound, and she soon bounces back. As a wife, she is seen as a wife, she is seen by a sociologist as being within the institution of marriage and performs the roles of housewife and of mother. She is indeed the carrier of these roles. According to his variant of sociological theory, he will try to construe her behavior as a mistress. He has difficulty in deciding whether to list it within the category deviance or whether to exclude it from the computer program as irrelevant. For the woman herself, one part of this role, the sexual act, is objectively much the same with husband or lover. What defines the difference is nothing in the act, well, perhaps a little in that, but the expectations and rules which the society imposes upon her. She ought to be a better carrier of these expectations, and the person who has heard about her affair is censorious. Meanwhile, the local branch of the Labour Party of which she is a functionary gets into debt. Her husband, keep, her husband keeps making scenes and her lover is becoming bored. And at work, where she is a trigger of proletarian productive relations, the boss decides to screw down peace rates. She gets headaches and stops playing in the orchestra. Beset with the contradictory exhortations of psychiatrist, priest, husband, lover, society, conductor, boss, fellow workers, party officials, all of whom see her as a carrier of this and that, as well as the shopping, she goes back to bed. In bed, she reads an article by a demographer, which shows the number of her children diverges from the norm, and one by an ecologist, which shows that three children are too many. Her depression deepens. We will leave her in this sad state in order to note in order to note that none of the dis disciple or disciplines or categories have done her any wrong. The demographer has correctly described her deviation from the norm and he has not the least interest in her lover. Even if she should conceive by him since the question of paternity is irrelevant to, the, to this norm. The party official who is seeking to collect the branch dues is not in the least concerned with her household affairs. He sees her, correctly, as an inefficient functionary. She is in no sense the subject of the expectations and sexual norms of society or of the church. She is the object of their scrutiny. And at work, she may certainly be seen as the carrier of productive relations, but not one of these definitions affect the fact that she remains a woman. Is the woman then no more than a point of, at which all these relations, structures, roles, expectations, norms, and functions intersect? 
Is she the carrier of all of them simultaneously? And is she acted by them and absolutely determined at their intersection? It is not by any means an easy question for many of these roles are not only imposed, they are internalized and they've gathered up like a knot inside her head. To answer this question, we would have to observe her history. I don't know how her history eventuates. I have two alternative scripts. One of them is obvious. She's carried off to a mental home after a suicide attempt and kept going on Valium. In the other, she goes back to work because in the last instance, the mortgage has to be paid and the children fed. At work, things are blowing up to a crisis. A militant workmate, this bit is unlikely, gives her Althusser to read. She turns the pages. Enlightenment breaks through. She shouts out, I'm not a bloody thing. She throws the book at the foreman. She calls out the workshop on strike. She leaves her husband and she, sa and she sacks her lover. She joins the women's movement. She leaves the Church of England. She rejoins the orchestra. And Greedy enjoys performing within that structure. That word doesn't make sense. A process with 50 subjects determined by conductor and score. But alas, she fancies the conductor and all her muddles are once again about to begin. As it happens, I do not know this woman, though I have known several like her, who have been good comrades and men like her as well. I've introduced her only as the bearer of an analogy. The analogy may not be pressed too far because the procedures required to observe the behavior of an individual are not the same as those required to observe historical eventuation. We cannot construct our historical or economic knowledge by first positing individuals as isolates. But the analogy will serve if it reminds us that in the people we observe and know, we find intersecting determinations, which they are always trying to handle and reconcile. That overdetermination can manifest itself as illness or immobility, that it is legitimate to view a person as a carrier of structures but that we can arrive at that person only through some of many views. That whatever we conclude in the endlessly receding argument of predetermination and free will, for our friend may have been determined by her Protestant upbringing to cry out, I am not a bloody thing. It is profoundly important that our Protestant prejudice should be renewed, that we should think ourselves to be free, which Althusser will not allow us to think. And that finally, neither a person nor society may be viewed as a sum of intersecting determinations, but can be known only in observation over time. We may offer another analogy, which evades the difficulties of positing an individual. We are familiar with analogies drawn from the rules of a game. Any complex game is unintelligible until we understand the rules. People appear to run around to start and stop in arbitrary and confused ways. A careful observer who already has some notion of games can infer the rules once this has been done. Everything becomes clear and continued observation will confirm or refine the rules which he has inferred. The anthropologist or historian is in much the same position as the observer. Societies and a society itself is a concept describing people within an imaginary boundary and actuated by common rules may be seen as very complex games, which sometimes afford very material evidences as to their character. The pitch, the goals, the teams sometimes are governed by visible rules, rule books of law and constitution, and are sometimes governed by invisible rules which the players know so deeply that they are never spoken and which must be inferred by the observer. For example, the players rarely kill the referee. The whole of life goes forward within structures of such visible and invisible rules, which prohibit this action and assign a special symbolic significance to that. Marx's most extraordinary accomplishment was to infer read, decode, 
the only partly visible structure of rules by which human relations were mediated by money, capital. He often glimpsed, sometimes grasped, other individual rules which we, after 100 years, are or ought to be able to read more plainly. There were other and significant symbolic and normative rules which, in my view, he overlooked. Some of these were not within the view of his contemporary knowledge, and for such rules political economy had no terms. When the, ru when the rules of a game have been read or inferred, we can then assign to each player his role or function in the game. He is, in terms of those rules, the game's carrier, an element within its structure, a halfback or a goalkeeper, in exactly this sense, we can say that a worker is the bearer of productive relations. Indeed, we have already defined her in this way, when we called her a worker rather than a second violin. But we must take the analogy further, for we do not go on to say that the goalkeeper is being gamed or the capitalist is being capitaled. This is what Althusser and also some structuralist anthropologists and sociologists would wish us to say. Althusser offers us a pseudo-choice. Either we must say that there are no rules, but only a swarm of individuals, or we must say that the rules game the players. The difference between playing a game and being gamed illustrates the difference between rule-governed structuration of historical eventuation, within which men and women remain as subjects of their own history, and structuralism. As always, Althusser has simply taken over a reigning fashion of bourgeois ideology and named it Marxism. In the old days, vulgar political economy saw men's economic, economic behavior as being lawed, although workers were obtuse and refractory in obeying these laws, but allowed to the autonomous individual an area of freedom in his intellectual, aesthetic, or moral choices. Today, structuralisms engross this area from every side. We are structured by social relations, spoken by, by pre-given linguistic structures, thought by ideologies, dreamed by myths, gendered by patriarchal sexual norms, bonded by effective obligations, cultured by mentalities, and acted by history script. None of these ideas is, in origin, absurd and some rest upon substantial additions to knowledge. But all slip at a certain point from sense to absurdity, and in their sum all arrive at a common terminus of unfreedom. Structuralism, this terminus of the absurd, is the ultimate product of self-alienated reason, reflecting the common sense of the times in which all human projects, endeavors, institutions, and even culture itself appear to stand outside of men, to stand against men as objective things, as the other, which in its own turn moves men around as things. In the old days, the other was then named God or fate. Today it has been christened anew as structure. I have said that Marx made visible the rules of capital. To do this, it was necessary to proceed by way of a critique of political economy. In this way, he was able to construct the concept of a capitalist mode of production, both as the circuit of capital and as a mode of self-reproduction, by which capital reproduced the productive relations which enabled its own reproduction. This mode of production could then be conceptualized as an integral structure in which all relations must be taken together as one set, and in which each rule is assigned its definition within that totality. From this he adduced, although sometimes wrongly, the forms of development through such a mode might, through such a mode might pass, and further and more rashly he projected its law of motion into the future. That these laws or tendencies did not, as he once truculently asserted, work with iron necessity towards inevitable results may be explained in part by the fact that he understood the countervailing tendencies at work. Contrary to the view of some theoretical practitioners, 
No worker known to historians ever had surplus value taken out of his hide without finding some way of fighting back. There are plenty of ways of going slow. And paradoxically, by his fighting back, the tendencies were diverted and the forms of development were themselves developed in unexpected ways. In another part, this was due to the fact that other countervailing tendencies arrived unhidden out of regions for which political economy had no terms. But these reservations do not in any way go to show that Marx's project was not legitimate. It was an epoch-making advance in knowledge to construct by arduous theoretical engagement, by hypothesis, and by equally arduous empirical investigation, the concept of a structured mode of production in this way. Aha, I am asked, is this not to give back to Althusser with my left hand, all that I have taken away with my right? And is not Althusser licensed to envisage capitalism as structure? The answer is no. And whoever asked that question may go to the back of the class. A capitalist mode of production is not capitalism. We pass on the exchange of one letter from the ad adjectival characterization of a mode of production, a concept within political economy, albeit within Marxist anti-political economy, to a noun descriptive of a social formation in the totality of its relations. We will leave our interrogator on the back bench for a few pages to meditate upon his folly and return to the mode of production. After all the rancor of my previous critique, this should at least be the occasion for a happy reunion. For historians within the Marxist tradition have for many decades employed the concept of a mode of production, have examined the labor process and the relations of production. I can recall a time in this country when there were not many of us. When this was our distinctive preoccupation and one which was decidedly disreputable. And now, not only among Althusserians, but among theoretical practitioners very generally, the mode of production has become the focus of a truly obsessional preoccupation. This, decidedly, is their thing. They are always undoing it and doing it up again. They are always examining its mechanism, rearranging its components, inserting a new pinion here, a, a balance wheel there, and oiling the moving parts with purified abstractions. The mode of production has become like a base camp in the Arctic of theory, which the explorers may not depart from for more than a hundred yards for fear of being lost in an ideological blizzard. What is odd about this mode of production is that it can be constructed and reconstructed with theory without any recourse to the knowledge of historians, anthropologists, and others. Althusser and Balabar are too rigorous even to acknowledge the findings of these disciplines. Hindus and Hearst show a casual acquaintance with some secondary work and employ themselves in demonstrating that this work, being ideo ideological in origin, is unnecessary to theory. And historians repay these tributes, not with anger, but with boredom. They do not reply or argue simply because the whole project of theoretical practice is idealist and irrelevant. For theoretical practice engenders these modes of production, not within theory or society, but within metaphysics. And a metaphysical mode of production in its turn will produce not commodities, but metaphysical concepts and categories, while at the same time reproducing endlessly its own conditions for metaphysical self-reproduction. <clears throat> like all cooks of the absolute, Um, like all cooks of the absolute, these practitioners have found the instant theoretical recipe, the handful of wholesome ingredients out of which all history and every society is baked. So that this is not, after all, a place of happy reunion, but a place of total disassoci disassociation between incompatible methods and traditions. It is as if a conference were to be held with 
on the one hand, all those concerned with sexual relations, gender roles, the forms and history of the family, kinship structures, child nurture, homosexuality, sexual psychology, the literature of profane and romantic love, and on the other hand, a party of theoretical practitioners who had reduced all this to the metaphysical contemplation of the reproductive organs, which produce all these manifestations and which, at the same time, reproduce themselves. One party would attain to knowledge through the investigation of a multiplicity of evidence and its own authentic expression. The other would be locked into a metaphysical circuit of ovulation and sperm. The participants would be baffled. They would decide to disengage and continue their proceedings in separate rooms, as theoretical practice and historical materialism have done. It is not a question of disagreement about this or that, but one of total incompatibility in the way in which a historian and such a theorist situates himself before a mode of production. We have authorities on productive relations who have never looked inside a feudal tenure or a bill of exchange or a woolen peace hall or a struggle around peace rates. And we have authorities on the labor process who have never found relevant to their exalted theory, Christopher Hill's work on the uses of subbetarianism, nor mine on time and work discipline, nor Eric Hobsbawm's on the tramping artisan, nor that of a generation of American, French, British labor historians, a group often dismissed with scorn on time and motion study, Taylorism and Fordism. It is not only that this kind of theoretical idealism is actively unhelpful, that, for example, in the immense area of study recently opened up, the study of peasant societies in which so much turns on subsistence economy, taxation and marketing, traditional norms and needs, inheritance practice, familial modes, particularist customary law. Theoretical practitioners are left fiddling with their model, trying to take into account the rural millions who are somehow marginal to the proper circuits of capital. It is not only that gross historical materiality stubbornly refuses to correspond to the purity of its concept, that whatever theoretical allowance is made for contradiction, it is never allowance enough. For in every historical now, conjuncture, the circuit of capital is being obstructed and resisted at every point. As men and women refuse to be reduced to its trigger, so that the forms are developed and diverted in theoretically improper ways by the class struggle itself. It is also that this idealism is actively misleading and, diverse and diversionary, giving us false historical results at every turn, imposing its own presuppositions upon the evidence, blockading all the empirical canals of the senses of knowledge, and as contemporary political theory leading only to bizarre kangaroo strategies, in which conclusions are already preempted by the arbitrary premises of this party or that sect, or else to the security of an armchair. But this is not this but is not this dismissal unfair? Is not theoretical practice with its relative autonomy and its intricate gearing greatly more subtle and rigorous than the vulgar economism which it displaced? The answer, in brief, is that this is a yes-type question to which we must reply no. It is a yes-type question because it reduces to a faceless and unidentifiable caricature all precedent theory and practice, and seeks to erase any evidence as to the vigorous alternative tradition on behalf of which I speak. And the reply must be no, because despite all its abstractions and saving clauses, the theoretical product is an idealist reductionism, as vulgar in its economism as anything that has gone before. We will, however, allow a more leisurely answer, and in this we may first offer an apology to Marxist economists. <clears throat> the theory of a mode of production belongs very properly within their own conceptual system. 
it is proper that it should be interrogated and refined. The continuing debates among economists may well be significant, and historians hope to be helped by their findings. More generally, the employment of the concept of mode of production is an improvement upon a certain slipshod use of the terms material base and productive forces, or it could be an improvement in minds open to any empirical conversation. As Williams has noted, it was not Marxism, but the systems with which it contended and continues to contend, which <clears throat> which had separated and abstracted various parts of this whole social process. It was the assertion and explanation of political forms and philosophical and general ideas as independent of above the, the material social process that produced a necessary kind of counter-assertion. In the flow of polemic, this was often overstated until it came to repeat in a simple reversal of terms, the kind of error it attacked. Hence, Marxism often took the coloring of a specifically bourgeois and capitalist kind of materialism. This is certainly true, but then it is also, and for the same reasons, true that to reduce all social and intellectual phenomena to effects of an essentialist metaphysical mode of production by whatever elaboration of mechanisms is to do more than enclose that old bourgeois materialism within idealist amber. There's also, we will allow, a great difference in the quality of theoretical practice. It is possible to practice upon a mode of production badly or well. Balabar practices so badly that he allows no purchase for a historian's interrogation. But Simon Clark, practicing on Althusser and Balabar, is able to illuminate their inconsistencies and absurdities in the clearest ways, and hence to emerge by way of critique with a lucid restatement of the concept of a mode of production. I find this helpful, and at the same time, I am relieved of the labor of going over the same task. Clark has evidently come to the very verge of the kangaroo reserve, but he is not yet quite over that verge, for he is able, when discussing different forms of society, to write. The relations of production on which these various modes of production are based will provide the basis for different, different forms of exploitation and correspondingly different relations of distribution. They will also be expressed in specific economic, ideological, and political forms which must be analyzed as developed forms of the fundamental relation of production. This is the same kind of circular act which we noted in Smelser, where the snake ate its own tail. Instead of a value system, the fundamental relation of production is swallowing its own effects. And the critical problem lies in the last few lines. Economic, ideological, and political forms must be analyzed as developed forms of the fundamental relation of production. The essentialist notion of imminence, the ultimate platonim platonism, lies there. Should we return to Marx, or should we argue the point independent of any authority? Let us try to do both together. It is certainly true, and it is generally held to be a fundamental Marxist proposition that there's some correspondence between a given mode of production and a social formation, including political and ideological forms. This is hardly surprising since production, social relations, political modes, and ideological constructions are all human activities. The Marxist proposition goes further and asserts not only some correspondence, but a correspondence in which the mode of production is determinant. Marx and Engels express this correspondence and this determination in a number of different ways. By the elaborate, but ultimately mechanical and unsatisfactory, spatial analogy of basis and superstructure, by means of blunt propositions such as social being determines social consciousness, itself a polemical counter-assertion of the kind indicated by Williams. By enigmatic, but suggestive analogies from natural science, a general illumination in which all other colors are plunged 
and by swift metaphorical gestures the hand mill gives you society <clears throat> with the feudal lord. Religious ideologies are a reflection of productive relations which appear as categories within political economy and these relations reveal that the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social structure and the corresponding specific form of the state. When we recall that some reciprocal interaction is also proposed, e.g. as between superstructure and basis, there is play enough in these propositions to allow for many adjustments and interpretations. Presented with these indecisive propositions, the practitioner who works within a Marxist tradition might take one or two courses. He might decide to select among them for the correct and scientific formulation, screw down more tightly, tinker with the mechanism, eliminate all play, theorize about the society effect and the ideological effect, and perfect an orary. I suppose that one may condone this course in a certain kind of philosopher or theologian who is never engaged in the difficult labor of reconstituting from, from historical material materials, an actualized mode of production, who does not understand the historian's necessary recourse to analogies and metaphorical suggestions as an indication of the connections and direction of the social process and mistakes these for literal statements as to some mechanism. <clears throat> he has never heard a stick break in the forest as a commoner disputes his rights with the king nor listen to the anguished silence and then the hysterical Saturnalia as a heretic is burned. He thinks it can all be plotted in a map in his head, this basis, that terrain, this region, level, and instance. In the end, he thinks that his thinking makes it so. The process that produces the concrete knowledge takes place wholly in the theoretical practice. There is, however, another possible course. We may commence with these various propositions as hypotheses, and then we may find out. This will lead us at once into a very different set of questions. Are these propositions true? Did Marx show them to be true, or did he assume them without any further testing? If they are true, are they significant and suggestive, or are they truisms which still leave everything to be found out? And again, if they are true, why are they true? In what ways and through which means does this correspondence assert itself? And finally, does our new knowledge gained in response to such questions enable us to return again to Marx, not to adjust and tighten up one formulation, but to modify and reorganize his concepts? The alternative Marxist tradition has been asking these kinds of questions for some decades. I don't hold power of attorney to speak for history, so that I can only report my own, own understanding of historical knowledge. The first question, are these propositions true, is the last an empirical one. In my own view, they have been shown to be true, but in the terms even more lax and, and equivocal than those of Marx. In diverse historical circumstances, research has shown that the economic movement finally asserts itself as necessary. <clears throat> the comparative study of feudal societies or of industrial revolutions has demonstrated the ways in which a generic mode of production has found roughly analogous expression within different societies and state institutions. In Marx's most fertile hypothesis, as stated in his well-known letter to Weidemeyer of 1852, that the existence of classes is only bound up with particular historic phases in the development of production, seems, seems to me to have been demonstrated beyond doubt, and with many consequent writers as to analogous forms of class expression within intellectual and social life. But the findings, while positive, has been, have been, uh, has been equivocal. They suggest not only a greater complexity and reciprocity of relations than Marx proposed, but also they raise the question of what significance we can place upon the correspondence. The complexity, as I have sufficiently argued, is not in the least illuminated by giving it, giving to it, a reputable new name. 
like relative autonomy. The critical concept The critical concept, unexamined by Althusser, is that of determination itself, hence the importance, as Williams and I and others have been insisting for years, and to the deaf, of defining determine in its senses of setting limits, and exerting pressures, and of defining law of motion as logic of process. This helps us at once to break out of the idealist circuit. We can no longer offer social formations as society affects or as developed forms of an imminent mode. The question as to the significance to be placed upon the correspondence is even more difficult, for the idealist notion commences with the proposition that the economic is, in the last instance, etc., <clears throat> determining, and then leaps hand in hand with its twin, vulgar economism, to the good old utilitarian assumption that it is therefore somehow more real in all ways. Once landed here, theoretical practice can deploy a number of arguments. <clears throat> Thus, if in a given society the decisive region appears to be non-economic, kinship, military power, then this can simply be redefined as the area to which the economic instance has been assigned. More commonly, other areas are simply regarded as being less real, a second or third order problems, as the concern of another region of theory, as yet immature and undeveloped, or simply as non-problems which may be spirited away with the wand of relative autonomy. But it is of little consolation to a prisoner languishing in 1976 in the foetid and overcrowded compound of a Calcaida gaul to be told that his is a third-order problem and that he is the victim of a relatively autonomous society effect. Worse than this, the half-hidden assumption that what is relatively autonomous is therefore less real and less deserving of theoretical or historical attention than the mode of production can afford to the theoretical practitioner if whim or ideology should strike him a stupefying laxity in analysis. Indeed, religions, ideologies, and the state itself, with all its armory of repressive apparatuses, being relatively autonomous, may develop over half centuries or centuries in any way they like, and the theorists of the mode of production and the security of their self-confirming propositions need not turn a theoretical hair. For they have already defined this mode as being essential and truly real, and the effects or regions or levels may go on their autonomous way. In exactly this way, in 1963, Althusser waves his wand in Stalinism unless as a third order problem was made to disappear. This is a quote from Althusser. Everything that has been said of the cult of the personality refers exactly to the domain of the superstructure and therefore of state organization and ideologies. Further, it refers largely to this domain alone, which we know from Marx's theory possesses a relative autonomy, which explains very simply in theory how the socialist infrastructure has been able to develop without essential damage during this period of errors affecting the superstructure." End quote. Very simple, but this arbitrary separation of a mode of production from everything that actually goes on in history, so characteristic of the idealist economist twin, ends up by telling us nothing and apologizing for everything. Such theory is rather like a doctor who, when his patient is in agony with a disease, consults for an hour and then pronounces that, while the disease is determined in the last instance by the body, it is a relatively autonomous body effect. As indeed it is, the disease is not a projection of the patient's soul, but medicine learned this many centuries ago. And for a long time, this spurious dissociation of production consciousness Itself only the old dichotomy, matter-mind, or body-soul reappearing in Marx's form has been challenged in the Marxist tradition on one side by historians and anthropologists who have insisted that ideas, norms, and rules be replaced within the mode of production without which it could not be carried on for a day. 
and on the other side by cultural materialists who have insisted that the notion of a superstructure was never materialist enough. Determination is a large self-important word which appears to pronounce on each case with finality. We are left to discover that everything is still to be found out. To revert to our earlier analogy, there may be a true sense in which a man's neurotic state may be determined in the last instance by his sexual nature, which in its turn is determined by his male reproductive organs. But this does not make his neurosis any less real, nor are we likely to understand it or to cure it by prolonged scrutiny of his penis. And moreover, to complicate the matter further, one symptom of his neurosis may be precisely to render him impotent. It is a simplistic analogy since societies are as complex as persons, but in different ways. But these two reservations as to the complexity of the correspondence and as to its significance are so severe as to call in question the effectivity of Marx's general notions. Very few of the critically significant, the most real problems which we confront in our actual lives appear to be directly and causally implicated in this field of correspondence. Nationalism, racism, sexual repression, fascism, and Stalinism itself are certainly not removed from this field, for the pressure of class antagonisms and class-based ideologies can be felt in all. But equally certainly, they cannot be seen as developed forms of the fundamental relation of production they are forms in their own right, and for their analysis we require, just as the psychi psychiatrist requires, a new set of terms, not entailed within the premises of political economy. This is not to say that Marx's propositions were wrong, although they were sometimes expressed so overconfidently that they licensed wrong conclusions. It was important to learn that neurosis was not caused by satanic possession, and important to learn that human affairs did not express the mind of divine providence or of great men, or of unfolding ideas, or of a benevolent, class-neutered market. Marx took knowledge across a threshold, pointed her towards the, wor the world, and told her to go and find out. And in that outer world beyond the secure base of the, most, of the mode of production, many of the most cherished of human concerns are cited. Moreover, this raises in a new way the whole problem of the effectivity of human agency of men and women as subjects of their own history. Within the secure circuits of a mode of production, it is easy enough for Althusser to envisage men as Traeger and to relapse into exactly the same mode of thought as that which Marx identified in Proudhon. From this point of view, man is only the instrument of which the idea or the eternal reason makes use in order to unfold itself. But in the world outside that door, it might, be, it might possibly be shown that agency had larger scope to exercise it, its effects. To be sure, this agency will not be set free from ulterior determinate pressures nor escape determinate limits. It is unlikely to hasten on the resolution of the extraordinary complexity and contradictions of India's overlapping modes of production. But it might be able to open the gate to the Calcutta goal and set our prisoner free. Indeed, it has done exactly that. It might even be able to resist or to legitimate the dominant ideological pressures of our time. It might collapse into complicity with Stalinist predestinarianism, or it might reason with Althusser and help to liberate from his influence another mind. Moreover, if we look towards any future described as socialist, there is no error more disabling and actively dangerous to the practice of any human freedom than the notion that there is some socialist mode of production as public or state ownership of the means of production within which some socialist relations or production are given, which will afford a categorical guarantee that some imminent socialist society, values, ideas, institutions, etc. will unfold itself, not perhaps instantaneously, for there is relative autonomy, etc., etc., but in good time, out of the womb of the mode of production itself. This is wholly untrue. Every choice in every institution is still to be made, and to suppose otherwise is to fall into an error as astonishing in its mystical crudity as Althusser's notion that under Stalin, the socialist infrastructure was able to develop without essential damage. 
So far from theory affording to us such comforting guarantees, the appearance within parties and ideologies which claim themselves to be in the vanguard of socialist endeavor, of metaphysical theologies so monstrous, within which will, within which will, choice, value, and men and women themselves disappear, is a most ominous premonition. We, we must liberate our minds now. If that ideology should ever claim a share in power, it will be too late. 15. <clears throat> we may now attempt to bring this argument together. I proposed in an earlier section that the hypotheses of historical materialism and the anti-political economy of capital were, however, closely related, distinct, this was clearly stated by Marx in his preface to the Paris manus Manuscripts of 1844, when he outlined his impossibly ambitious life, life project. I will therefore present one after another a critique of law, of morality, politics, etc., in different independent brochures, and then finally in a separate work tried to show the connection of the whole and the relationship of the parts to each other and end with a criticism of the elaboration of the material by speculative philosophy. Therefore, in the present work, the connection of the political economy with the state, law, morality, civil life, etc., is only dealt with insofar as political economy itself professes to deal with these subjects. Meanwhile, the hypotheses of historical materialism, the relationship of the parts to each other, were rapidly presented between 1845 and 1848 in the German ideology, the poverty of philosophy, and the Communist Manifesto. Frederick Engels played a major part in the development of these hypotheses, and behind Engels we find the direct influence of the class organizations and class consciousness of the British working class movement. As Stedman Jones has shown in a helpful study, Engels was too modest as to his own part in this joint production and there is thus the greater reason to attend with respect to the caveats in his late letters. Thus, the hypotheses of historical materialism were already presented by 1848. These hypotheses Engels resumed in several of his subsequent prefaces to editions of the Manifesto, thus to the German edition of 1883. The basic thought running through the Manifesto that economic production and the stature and the structure of society of every historical epoch necessarily arising therefrom constitute the foundation for the political and intellectual history of that epoch. That consequently all history has been a history of class struggles. This basic thought belongs solely and exclusively to Marx. These propositions Engels claimed in his preface to the English edition of 1888 were destined to do for history what Darwin's theory has done for biology. Nevertheless, as we have seen, these hypotheses remained largely undeveloped over the next 40 years. They were elaborated more by Engels than by Marx, and at the end of his life, Engels could clearly see that only a little has been done. Meanwhile, and for at least 20 years, Marx had turned aside to wrestle with his antagonist, political economy, and in this contest, to elaborate what I've argued, may be seen as itself an anti-structure to that structure. I have argued that Marx was himself for a time trapped within the circuits of capital, in imminence manifesting <clears throat> itself in forms, and that he only partly sprung that trap in capital. It is to this trap, the Grundry's face of Marx, that theoretical practice so eagerly returns. It is from the heart of this trap that Althusser extracts his textual licenses of authority, and he wishes to return us to the conceptual prison, mode of production equals so social formation, that had been imposed upon Marx by his bourgeois antagonist. How far Marx himself ever became fully aware of his imprisonment is a complex question, and not one which, in my view, is of much importance to the present advance of knowledge. We are interested in advancing history and the understanding of history and not in Marxology, but at least we should note that Marx in his increasing preoccupation in his last years with anthropology 
was resuming the projects of his Paris youth. The problem, as we have sufficiently argued, is to move from the circuits of capital to capitalism, from a highly conceptualized and abstracted mode of production within which determinism appears as absolute, to historical determinations as the exerting of pressures, as a logic of process within a larger and sometimes countervailing process. It would, of course, be ridiculous to suggest that Marx, in Capital, did not repeatedly come to the margin between political economy and history, structure and process, and repeatedly gesture, often in greatly enlightening ways, as to the pressure of the first upon the forms and logic of the second. But the gestures remain hypotheses. They are assumed rather than shown to be so. And, moreover, the assumptions are supported by the prior hypotheses of historical materialism, which long precede capital, but which have been left both undeveloped and unexamined. And the problems arise repeatedly at what I have called the junction concepts. Need, which may reappear within anthropology as norm and within history as wants or values, mode of production, which may reappear as a determining pressure within a complex historical process, class as posited as, as the structuring of a mode of production, or as eventuating in ways which may never be predetermined, as historians have sufficiently shown, determination itself as closure or as pressure. Moreover, political economy, including Marx's anti-structure, had no terms, had deliberately and for the purposes of its analytical science excluded the terms which become immediately essential if we are to comprehend societies and histories. Political economy has terms for use value, for exchange value, for monetary value, and for surplus value, but not for normative value. It has no terms for other areas of consciousness. How does one do the symbolic rituals of Tiburn or of Lenin's, or now Mao's, mausoleum, into terms of value, price, and profit? We, might, we may hypothesize that one vocabulary will reappear within the other, but we still do not know how, by what means, or mediations. And it is here that we find that Engels' analogy between Darwin and Marx was, in one respect, even closer than he intended. For just as Darwin proposed and demonstrated an, an evolutionary process, which proceeded by means of a hypothetical transmutation of the species, species which had hitherto been hypostasized as immutable and fixed, and yet remained wholly in the dark as to the actual genetic means of this transmission and transmutation, so in an analogous way historical materialism as a hypothesis was left unprovided with its own genetics. If a correspondence could be proposed and in some part demonstrated between a mode of production and historical process, how, in what ways, did this come about? It is an important question because one answer will be simply to set aside the problem unanswered. And theology will then say that evolution manifests the peculiar working out of the divine will, while theoretical practice will then say that history manifests the development of the forms of capital. The other answer, the tradition of Mendel and of historical and cultural materialism, will be to find out. What we have found out, in my view, lies within a missing term, human experience. This is exactly the term which Althusser and his followers wished to blackguard out of the club of thought under the name of empiricism. Men and women also return as subjects within this term, not as autonomous subjects, free individuals, but as persons experiencing their determinate productive situations and relationships as needs and interests and as antagonisms, and then handling this experience within their consciousness and their culture, two other terms excluded by theoretical practice, in the most complex, yes, relatively autonomous ways, and then often, but not always, through the ensuing structures of class, acting upon their determinate situations in their turn. It must be emphasized that, while this is not incompatible with the hypotheses of Engels and Marx, it is not exactly the same as their propositions. For we have introduced one term, culture, which in its anthropological derivation, Althusser would deplore, 
and which in its subsequent definition and elaboration within historical knowledge was not available to Marx. It is a term which I am wholly committed to defend and to defend if Marxologists insist that it is necessary against Marx. For it is not true that Marx passed over in innocence the need to provide his theory with some genetics. He attempted such a provision, first in this writings on alienation, commodity, fetishism, and reification, and second in his notion of man, in his history, continuously making over his own nature. We will only note in passing, since other critics have examined this question, that Althusser excludes all exploration of either set of suggestive notions from this canon. Of the first set of concepts, I wish only to say this. They propose, a they propose to supply a genetics to explain how history is determined in ways which conflict with the conscious intentions of its subjects in terms of mystified rationality. Men imprison themselves within structures of their own creation because they are self-mystified. While historians may find these notions suggestive in certain areas, as in the study of ideologies, they would argue, I certainly will argue, that in more general application, they are the product of an overly rational mind. They offer an explanation in terms of mystified rationality for now rational or irrational behavior and belief, whose sources may not be adduced from reason. As to the second set of concepts, man making over his own nature, while they are important and point the right way, they remain so undeveloped that, in effect, they do little more than restate the prior question in new terms. We are still left to find out how. Thus we return to the missing terms, experience, and at once we enter into the real silences of Marx. This is not only a point of junction between structure and process, but a point of disjunction between alternative and incompatible traditions. For one tradition, that of idealist dogma, these silences are blanknesses or absences of rigor in Marx, failures fully to, real, fully to theorize his own concepts. And they must be sewn together by bridging concepts conceptually generated from the same conceptual matrix. But as we have seen, this pursuit of the security of a perfect totalized theory is the original heresy against knowledge. Such perfect idealist creations each seem superbly joined by invisible conceptual stitching, always end up in the jumble sale. If Marx had really designed a theory like that, it would be down in the bargain basement already, along with Spencer, During, and Comte, to be snapped up by some graduate student looking for a bizarre patch of material to sew onto her doctoral jeans. In its present incarnation as theoretical practice, this notion of theory is like a blight that is settled on the mind. The empirical senses are occluded. The moral and aesthetic organs are repressed. The curiosity is sedated. All the manifest evidence of life or of art is distrusted as ideology. The theoretical ego enlarges, for everyone else is mystified by appearances. And the devotees gather intensely around the mode of production. Like the approaches to the altar of Lakshmi in an ancient Hindu tem temple, the passages are long, slippery, and ornate, but there at length she is, the goddess of material wealth, encrusted with gold and jewels, roped with garlands, and with nothing visible but her huge enigmatic eyes. They do her obeisance and encant her several names, la structure adamanante, the mode, the CMP, the rites which they perform are sometimes pitiful, sometimes comic. Critics struggle to decode poems, poems as the reenactment of theory or of ideology in opaque terms. And behind these terms lies the mode, the CMP, just as in the inert Platonism of their theory, all culture and all social life has been reduced to the mode so their vocabulary is stewed down until it is reduced to the same denatured glue. A double articulation, GMP, GII, or GIGI, AI, LMP, is, for example, possible, whereby a GI category, when transformed by AI into an ideological component, 
of an LMP may then enter into conflict with the GMP social relations it exists to reproduce. It is kind of this literary critic to provide us with an example, but to suppose this to advance a science of materialist aesthetics is to culminate both science and materialism, or calumniate both science and materialism. Not all the rites are so wholehearted. The pilgrims are sometimes critical and querulous, but since in some part of their hearts they still wish to worship the absolute, they do not repudiate but seek only to amend the rites. Hence the problems which they can really see are reduced to pseudo-problems within a conceptual system designed to repel their solution. Even excellent historians who ought to know better and who perhaps do ponder the lack of a precise structural mechanism to connect the base and the superstructure and meditate on the ways in which this omission can be conceptually repaired. But what is wrong and what always and what always and was always wrong is the analogy we start with, body soul, and the notion that the joint can be mended with a mechanism. Socialist feminists who have a genuine grudge against the silences of Marxism attempt by arduous exercises of theory to insert a new flywheel, reproduction of the labor force, into the orary, hoping that its inertia will somehow miraculously, miraculously motor on the, all the, fuck, motor all the variegated development forms of sexual repression and expression, familial modes and gender roles. But what is wrong is not that they have proposed the problem, but they have reduced it to a pseudo-problem by attempting to insert it into a machine designed for its exclusion. And at the same time, they have been tricked into dismantling their problem's whole challenge and identity and have subdued it to the same general blight. A cloud no bigger than a man's hand crosses the English Channel from Paris, and then, in an instant, the trees, the orchard, the hedge grows, the hedge rows, the field of wheat, are black with locusts, when at length they rise to fly on to the next parish. The bows are bared of all culture, the fields have been stripped of every green blade of human aspiration, and in those skeletal forms, in that blackened landscape, theoretical practice announces its discovery, the mode of production, not only substantive knowledge, but also the very vocabularies of the human project, compassion, greed, love, pride, self-sacrifice, loyalty, treason, calumny, have been eaten down to the circuits of capital. These locusts are very learned Platonists. If they said it, if they said it on the Republic, I don't know what that means, they would leave it picked clean of all but the idea of a contradiction between a philosopher and a slave. However elaborated the inner mechanisms, torsions, and autonomies, theoretical practice constitutes the ultimate in reductionism, a reduction not of religion or politics to economics, but of the, disciple, of the disciplines of knowledge to one kind of basic theory only. Theory is forever collapsing back into ulterior theory. In disallowing empirical inquiry, the mind is confined forever within the compound of the mind. It cannot walk abroad. It is struck down with theoretical cramp, and the pain is tolerable on condition that it, does, that it does not move its limbs. That, then, is the system of closure. It is the place where all Marxisms, conceived of as self-sufficient, self-validating, self-extrapolating theoretical systems, must end. At its worst, and this is where it is usually at, Theoretical practice is the end, and we may thank Althusser for demonstrating this with such rigor. But if we return to experience, we can move from that point once again into an open exploration of the world and of ourselves. This exploration makes demands of equal theoretical rigor, but within that dialogue of conceptualization and empirical engagement which we have already examined, this exploration may still be within the Marxist tradition in the sense that we are taking Marx's hypotheses and some of his central concepts and setting these to work. But the end of this exploration is not to discover a reformed, finite conceptual system, Marxism. 
there is and can never be such a finite system. I am sorry to disappoint those practitioners who suppose that all that it is necessary to know about history can be constructed from a conceptual mechano set. One can only return in the end from these explorations with better methods and a better map, with a certain sense of the whole social process, with expectations as to process and as to structured relationships, with a certain way of situating oneself before the materials, with certain key concepts themselves to be employed and tested and reformed of historical materialism, class, ideology, mode of production. On the margins of the map, we will always meet the boundaries of the unknown. What remains to be done is to interrogate the real silences through the dialogue of knowledge. And as these silences are penetrated, we do not just sew up one new concept to the old fabric. We find it is necessary to reorder the whole set of concepts. There is no innermost altar that is sacrosanct against inter interrogation and revision. Here lies the difference between Marxism and the Marxist tradition. It is possible to practice as a Marxist, but to regard Marxisms to be obscurantisms, <laughs> as manifestly in a dozen forms they have become. This has nothing to do with one's admiration for Marx and his work. On the contrary, to admire that work is to place oneself as apprentice to it, to employ its terms, to learn to work in a dialogue of the same kind. But emulation should never rest upon literal-minded reverence, not even, as with Althusser, pretended reverence for what Marx intended to say, but an unaccountably forgot. It must arise from an understanding of the provisional and exploratory nature of all theory, and the openness with which one must approach all knowledge. This must also entail a respect for the continuity of an intellectual culture, which is not to be seen as fractured into two halves between the BC and AD of Marx's epistemological break, and in which all other minds are knowledge and knowledges are to be measured against the rule of Marxist science. It is the very notion of, Marx, of Marxism as science that we find the authentic trademark of obscurantism, obscurantism, and of an, and of an obscurantism borrowed like so much else from a bourgeois ideology of great longevity. Utilitarians, Malthusians, positivists, Fabians, and structural functionalists all suppose themselves to be practicing a science and the most unabashed academic center of brutalized capitalist ideology in contemporary England acclaims itself as a school of economics and political science. When Marx and Engels claimed that they were applying scientific methods to the study of society, the claim may on occasion be upheld. When they supposed that they were founding a science, Marxism, they were locking prison gates upon their own knowledge. The matter is now more grave than that. Marxism has for decades been suffering from a wasting disease of vulgar economism. Its, motion, its motions have been enfeebled, its memory failing, its vision obscured. Now it has swiftly passed into a last delirium of idealism, and the illness must prove terminal. Theoretical practice is already the rigor mortis of Marxism setting in. Marxism no longer has anything to tell us of the world, nor any way of finding out. The impulse is to fly for our reason from this scene of a devastation. Honorable men like Cornelius Castoriadis, who have not abandoned for an instant their engagement with capitalism, have left, have left the Marxist tradition in this way. They see it as irreparable, inherently elitist, dominative, and anti-democratic, the scientists and the vulgar rest, and condemned by its orthodox and Stalinist fruits. And I go with their critique a good part of the way, a salute old comrades of so socialism ou barbaric, some some part I have stated on my, in my own terms, but even in their bitter polemic with Marxism, we see that they are employing and putting to better use concepts which they first learned from Marx. From Marxisms and the tradition of open empirical inquiry, originating in the work of Marx and employing, developing, and revising his concepts have never been the same thing. So then, white, so then why fight over a name? 
for a Marxism I would not fight, for I would fight with a guilty conscience. Marx was often wrong, and sometimes wrong in damaging ways. Not all Althusser's licenses of authority are as spurious as his sentence from the poverty of philosophy. Some part of Marx points towards a system and science in ways which afford uncomfortable continuities to the isms and state ideologies of her time. The Grenry's face of Marx, the notion of capital's imminence, affords a premonition of Althusser, although these premonitions are plainly contradicted in a hundred other places. Marx shares with other great and fertile thinkers, Hobbes, Machiavelli, Milton, Pascal, Vico, Rousseau, an ambiguity inherent in the very vigor and openness of their thought. In taking us across a threshold, he leaves us at a door. We leave old problems behind and we gain exactly a perspective upon the further range of problems ahead, some of which he could see, but few of which he could, in anticipation, solve. He places us he places us in a new theoretical space from which alternative developments lead forward. One name for this space is ambiguity, another is possibility. The very diversity of schools of thought which all claim a common Marxist inheritance and all of which can produce different licenses of authority is proof of that. Marxism has been one possible development, although one with only an attenuated relationship to Marx. But the open, exploratory, self-critical Marxist tradition has been another development altogether. Its presence can be found in every discipline, in many political practices, and in every part of the world. I had intended at this point to insert some comments upon a Marxist tradition which I know well, that of historiography, but I will reserve, I will reserve these notes for another place. I don't wish to personalize what is a very severe and general intellectual crisis nor to allow it to be supposed that I am placing some Anglo-Marxist tradition against the Franco-Marxism of Althusser. The first tradition is not Anglo-Saxon. It is a vigorous, it is vigorous not only in Scotland and Wales, but in France and in India, in Italy, and as for example, in the tenacious tradition of monthly review in the United States, nor is it in any sense confined to historiography. The second ism is not representative of the best French socialist thought and is only one extreme systemati systematization of systems, which are found as state ideologies or within Western Marxism. Nor do I have any authority to speak for my fellow historians in the British Marxist tradition. I will therefore simply indicate this as one location for an alternative tradition and make one comment. Those who suppose, and these include half the lumpen intelligentsia of Oxbridge, that Althusser and his colleagues were making some novel and flexible reappraisals of the Marxist problematic when they gestured at relative autonomy and, in the last instance, and that, before this revolution, all practicing Marxists were subdued to vulgar dogma or dumb empiricism. These people are simply disclosing their ignorance of historical and cultural materialism. In, party in, in particular, their knowledge of history can only have been gathered from travelers' tales, and from such travelers as Sir John Mandeville, the good burgher of Liege, who never left his notary's office. Relative autonomy was where we started from, and we started with the aid of others who had started therefore before us. It would, after all, have been somewhat difficult for us to have examined the drama of Aeschylus, ancient Greek science, the origins of Buddhism, the city-state, Cistercian monasteries, utopian thought, Puritan doctrines, feudal tenures, the poetry of Marvell, Methodist revivalism, the symbolism of Tyburn, Grand Peur and riots, Beminist sections, or sects, primitive rebels, economic and imperialist ideologies in every type of class confrontation, negotiation and refraction, without, somewhere along the line, stumbling upon a difficulty. I do not claim that we have done all this expertly, definitively, or even well. My concern is a different one. It is to emphasize that we entered through historical experience directly into the real silences of Marx. What did we find? Not, I fear, a better theory. 
historical materialist as a new closed ism. We found some new knowledge, we developed our own methods and the discourse of our discipline, and we advanced towards a common understanding of the full historical process. What else we discovered is more controversial, and I can only report my own sense of this. We confirmed all of those late warnings of Engels. It is impossible to move by the change of a letter from the capitalist mode of production to capitalism as a social formation. We explored both in theory and in practice those junction concepts, such as need, class, and determine, by which, through the missing term, experience structure is transmuted, transmuted into process. And the subject re-enters into history. We greatly enlarge the concept of class, which historians in the Marxist tradition commonly employ. Deliberately, and not out of some theoretical innocence, with a flexibility and indeterminacy disallowed both by Marxism and by orthodox sociology. And at experience, we were led on to re-examine all those dense, complex, and elaborated systems by which familial and social life is structured and social consciousness finds realization and expression. Systems which the very rigor of the discipline in Ricardo or in the marks of capital is designed to exclude. Kinship custom, the invisible and visible rules of social regulation, hegemony and deference, symbolic forms of domination and of resistance, religious faith and millennial impulses, manners, law, institutions, and ideologies, all of which in their sum comprise the genetics of the whole historical process, all of them jointed at a certain point in common human experience, which itself, as distinctive class experiences, exerts its pressure on the sum. When I saw that we explored outwards in this way, I don't mean that we were the first comers or that we were unaided by historians, anthropologists, and others in different traditions. Our debts are manifold, but in my view, we did not discover other and coexistent systems of equal status and coherence to the system of anti-political economy, exerting co-equal determining pressures, a kinship mode, a symbolic mode, an ideological mode, etc. Experience, we have found, has in the last instance been generated in material life, has been structured in class ways, and hence social being has determined social consciousness. La structure still dominates experience, but from that point her determinate influence is weak. For any living generation, and any now, the ways in which they handle experience defies prediction and escapes from any narrow definition of determination. I think we have found out something else of even greater significance for the whole project of socialism, for I introduced a few pages back another necessary middle term, culture, and we find that with experience and culture we are at a junction point of another kind, for people do not only experience their own experience as ideas within thought and its procedures, or, as some theoretical practitioners suppose, as proletarian instinct, etc. They also experience their own experience as feeling, and they handle their feelings within their culture as norms, familial and kinship obligations and recipro reciprocities, as values, or through more elaborated forms within art or religious beliefs. This half of culture, and it is a lull, and it is a full one half, may be described as affective and moral consciousness. This is exactly not to argue that morality is some autonomous region of human choice and will, arising independently of the historical process. Such a view of morality has never been materialist enough, and hence it is often reduced that formidable inertia in sometimes formidable revolutionary force into a wishful idealist fiction. It is to say, on the contrary, that every contradiction is a conflict of value as well as a conflict of interest, that inside every need there is an affect or want on its way to becoming an ought and vice versa, that every class struggle is at the same time a struggle over values and that the project of socialism is guaranteed by nothing, certainly not by science or by Marxism-Leninism, 
but can find its own guarantees only by reason and through an open choice of values. And it is here that the silence of Marx and of most Marxisms is so loud as to be deafening. It is an odd silence to be sure, since as we have already noted, Marx in his wrath and compassion was a moralist in every stroke of his pen. Besieged by the triumphant moralism of Victorian capitalism, whose rhetoric concealed the actualities of exploitation and imperialism, his polemical device was to expose all moralism as a sick deceit. The English established church will more, will more readily pardon an attack on 38 of its 39 articles than on 139th of its income. His stance became that of an anti-moralist. This was true in equal degree of Engels, whose inadequate arguments and anti-during I do not mean to examine. By the 1880s, Engels's overt distaste for moralism was such that he looked straight through the extraordinary genius of Morris and failed even to notice what was there. To the end of his life, when confronting in his anthropological researches problems manifestly demanding analysis in terms not derivative from political economy, Marx, while acknowledging the problems, was always trying to shove them back into an economic frame of reference. When Maine referred to the massive influences, which we may call for shortness moral, Marx impatiently annotated the text. This moral shows how little Maine, underst how little Maine understand of the matter, as far as these influences, economical before everything else, possess a moral modus of existence. This is always a derived secondary modus and never the Prius. But this is not any analysis. It is simply a refusal to break the silence. If the moral influences exist as a moral modus, then the existed must be analyzed in a vocabulary of norms, values, obligations, expectations, taboos, etc. That they are economical before everything else and are derived secondary is a prejudgment or, more politely, in hypothesis, which nowhere in Marx's work is fully examined, which his major project excludes from consideration, and which, in its turn, is derived from a particular and limited definition of the economic. In this whole area, Morris was immensely more perceptive than Engels or Marx. This silence was transmitted to the subsequent Marxist tradition in the form of a repression, this repression, in its turn, made it more easy for the major tradition to turn its back upon Morris and many other voices, and to capitulate to an economism which, in fact, simply took over a bourgeois utilitarian notion of need, and, as a necessary complement to this, to foster a paltry philistinism towards the, towards the arts. It was only necessary for Marxist science to enter into the kingdom of socialism, and all else would be added thereunto. And Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism did, and we know with what results. That is a crassly oversimplified account of a more complex and more contested development, but we have now tracked the last of Althusser's ogres, moralism, to its lair. Its lair is found to be less in the forest of bourgeois ideology than deep in the heart of the international working class movement itself. This ogre has given to that movement a utopian nerve of aspiration, the muscles of solidarity, and on occasion, the courage of revolutionary self-sacrifice. It has also on repeated occasions impelled revolts and defections within communist parties and a running polemic against the practices of those parties and the moral vacancies of the Marxist vocabulary. In 1956, it assumed the proportions of mass revulsion within the international communist movement against Stalinist practices and apologetics. Its most articulate spokesmen, the ogres incarnate, were very often poets and novelists. Tuin, Wazik, Pasternak, Derry, Ilias, uh, Solz Solzhenitsyn. Once again, so far from Althusser advancing a critique of Stalinism, he is engaged in an ideological police action against that critique by attempting to to disallow the most important terms in which that critique has been made. In this case, and in this case only, the license of authority which Althusser produces is authentic. It is indeed signed by Marx and countersigned. 
with a caveat as to truly human morality by Engels. This is perhaps why Althusser never bothers to argue the case, but can simply assume that all Marxists must agree that moralism is a hideous enormity. What he has to say about moralism is rarely specific. In For Marx and Reading Capital, the problem's presence is to be noted mainly in the careful strategies employed to ensure its absence from the text. On the one hand, all questions of norms, effective relationships, and rules are dismissed in the same gesture that dismisses anthropology. This enables him and all theoretical practitioners to set aside unread 50 years of work in social history, anthropology, and adjacent disciplines, some of it by Marxist practitioners, and all of it enlightening the problem of relative autonomy, which is supposedly an object of Althusser's rigorous labors. On the other hand, morality is simply equated to bourgeois morality, i.e. ideology. This is a world of alibis, sublimations, and lies, or, with politics and religion, a world of myths and drugs, and Marxists can have no interest in it except to demystify it. Moralism, or the recourse of ethics, is the shadow of humanism, whose function, we remember, is to offer an imaginary treatment of real problems. Old comrades will certainly recognize this invincible, Stalinist formula, pronounced on every uncomfortable occasion by every party hack. True morality equals whatever furthers the best interests of the working class. The party, guided by Marxist science, is best able to decide what those best interests are and how lucky the working class is to have a daddy to do that. And since what are at issue are interests, which can be determined with the precision of science, no choice of values or of means can be involved. When it was decided that after his death by the party that Stalin was in some points wrong, no question of Stalinism's moral stench was involved. An investigation of that might have brought even Marxism and the party under suspicion. The vocabulary permitted only errors and mistakes, misjudgments of best interests, to be allowed. That, after some years, the decidedly unscientific term crimes has now been allowed may be attributed not to revisionism, but to an opportunist reflex in the face of the accusing moral sensibility of the millions. There is something more in Althusser's subsequent essay on ideology and ideological state apparatuses. This is perhaps the ugliest thing he has ever done, the crisis of the idealist delirium. I will spare myself the tedium of criticism, since in its naivety it is refusal of all rel relevant evidence and its absurd idealist inventions it exposes itself. Ethics, etc., are offered as an ideological state apparatus, and only as that, imposed upon the innocent and utterly passive recipient man by means of the family state apparatus and the educational state apparatus. This ideology imposes upon individuals the imaginary relationships to their real conditions of existence. And to explain how it does this, Althusser invents a wholly imaginary device of interpolation or hailing by which the state via its ideological apparatus, religious, ethical, legal, political, aesthetic, etc., cries out to individuals Ahoy there! It is only necessary for the state to hail them, and they are recruited instantly to whatever imaginary relationship the state requires. Hailing has always gone one, and it hailing has always always gone one, and it always will in any society. I think it's supposed to be gone on, not gone one. This is so not because people cannot live and sustain relationships without values and norms but because ideology is indispensable in any society if men are to be formed, transformed, and equipped to respond to the demands of their conditions of existence. Notice once again the passive, transitive form, the reification of agency by the other. By means of interpolation or hailing, men and women are constituted within ideology as, a is, as imaginary subjects. For example, as jeunes étudiants catholiques or as Ulster Protestants. It is a touching scenario and, what, and one which could only have been written by a gentleman who has lived a retired life. 
It suggests the future for its author as a scriptwriter for Watch with Mother. The wicked witch of state appears, the wand of ideology is flourished, and hey presto, not only has the prince become a frog, but the entire coach and six of the reformist trade union movement, another ideological state apparatus, has become a matchbox drawn by six white mice. But if any readers in this country have been imposed upon or interpolated by the loud hailing of the several British import agencies for Western Marxism, including HELAS, one heavy import agency which some years ago I had a part in founding to suppose that this is the best that the Marxist tradition in France can do with sociology, communications, and educational theory, etc., then I beg them to be disabused. They might commence their re-education by attending to Pierre Bourdieu. What is obvious about these tormented constructions is that they are the desperate devices employed by a naive rationalism in an attempt to trick up a new rationalist explanation for non-rational behavior. That is, the effective and moral consciousness must somehow be construed as displaced rationality, ideology, and not as lived experience handled in distinctive ways. Althusser might at least have, er have learned from Merleau-Ponty that consciousness is lived as much as it, as it is known. These devices can, as always, boast formidable credentials within bourgeois ideology. The value, um, tact antimony, in which value or morality is supposedly an autonomous area of choice, resting upon the desocialized individual, has continually reappeared as its alter ego. The eviction of value from social and economic science, the segregation of morality within the palisades of the personal, a socially ineffectual space of private preferences. We are permitted today to have moral preferences about sexual conduct, but the questions of economic growth are scientific matters in which no choices of value are entailed. The good old utilitarian notion that all facts are quantifiable and measurable, and hence can be ingested by a computer, and that whatever is not measurable is not a fact, is alive and kicking and in possession of a large part of the Marxist tradition. And yet what cannot be measured has had some very measurable material consequences. This may explain why theoretical practitioners refuse to admit historical evidence to their seminars on moralism and ideology. Historians would very soon have to point out that all that was being done was to invent for utilitarianism a new set of idealist credentials. Values are neither thought nor hailed, they are lived and they arise within the same nexus of material life and material relations as do our ideas. They are the necessary norms, rules, expectations, etc. learned and learned within feeling, within the habitus of living, and learned in the first place within the family, at work, and within the immediate community. Without this learning, social life could not be sustained, and all production would cease. This is not to say that values are independent of the coloration of ideology. Manifestly, this is not the case. Nor how, when, e when experience itself is structured in class ways, could this be so. But to suppose from this that they are imposed by a, st by a state as ideology is to make the whole social and cultural process. This imposition will always be attempted with greater or less success. But it cannot succeed at all unless there is some congruence between the imposed rules and view of life and the necessary business of living a given mode of production. Moreover, values no less than material needs will always be a locus of contradiction, of struggle between alternative values and views of life. If we say that values are learned within lived experience and are subject to its determinations, we need not therefore surrender to a moral or cultural relativism, nor need we suppose some uncrossable barrier between value and reason. Men and women argue about values, they choose between values, and in their choosing they adduce rational evidence and interrogate their own values by rational means. 
This is to say that they are as much, but no more determined in their values as in their ideas and actions. They are as much, but no more subjects of their own affective and moral consciousness as of their general history. Conflicts of value and choices of value always take place. When a person joins or crosses the picket line, that person is making a choice of values. Even if the terms of the choice in some part of what the person chooses with are socially and culturally determined. Historical and cultural materialism cannot explain morality away as class interests in fancy dress, since the notion that all interests can be subsumed in scientifically determinable material objectives is nothing more than utilitarianism's bad breath. Interests are what interests people, including what interests them nearest to the heart. A materialist examination of values must situate itself not by idealist propositions, but in the face of cultural, culture's material abode, the people's way of life, and above all, their product and familial relationships. And this is what we have been doing in over many decades. Althusserian notions of ideology have the quaintness of an antique, a piece of ornate rationalist Victoriana. We have examined the value systems of peasantries of the patriarchal household, the, the acquisitive values of insurgent capitalism, and the intense struggles around these. The values of foresters, yeomen, artisans, handloom weavers, factory workers. We have examined these as a locus of conflict at inarticulate, subarticulate, sublimated, and at complex and arduously contested levels of articulacy. What else is the country and the city about? For the effective and moral consciousness discloses itself within history and within class struggles, sometimes as a scarcely articulate inertia, custom superstition, sometimes as an articulate conflict between alternative class-based value systems the moral economy of the crowd, the confrontation around the 1834 poor law, sometimes as a displaced confusion, but nonetheless real and passionate encounter within religious forms, Methodism, millennialism, sometimes as the brutal imposition by church or state of a moralism, the sanctified burning of heretics, sanctified Stalinist state trials, and sometimes is one of the most rigorous and complex disciplines known within intellectual culture, the full disclosure of values and the rational argument between values exemplified in literature and in a certain kind of disciplined moral critique. All this will not go away because it is defined out of our theory. I can only suppose from certain references of theoretical practitioners to moralism that these imagine a moral choice or a choice between values to be a kind of grunt and a grunt which is the reflex of ideology. And that they suppose that one grunt is as good as any other and have never noticed that it may take the form of a discipline with its own arduous and relevant discourse of the proof. There are of course rotten moralisms just as there are rotten ideologies and philosophies. We have been examining one and insofar as the full disclosure of choices between values is inhibited, insofar as the articulate discourse of the proof is actively suppressed, so any value-informed view of life will rot away into rhetoric and hypocritical moralistic oratory. Oops. I lost my spot. This is exactly the case with Stalinism. This is exactly why Stalinism has always most distrusted poets. This is exactly why the intellectual apologists for Stalinism have always sought to block off any possible moral critique. And this is exactly why one form of the protest against Stalinist ideology and forms has very often been moralistic. But since it has been denied every opportunity for open articulation, it often appears as a kind of displaced, illusory, and of necessity, utopian moralism, as a reversion to Greek Orthodox faith as nationalist self-exclusion, as personalist self-isolation, or as Solzhenitsyn, as the agonized heartbeat within a heartless world. And so we may confidently predict the Soviet Union will continue to astonish us. Ever more bizarre and immaterial forms of moral consciousness will arise as superstructure upon that severely scientific material base. 
the Soviet repressive and ideological state apparatuses in, in, in inhibiting any open argument about values have not only denied to individuals the right of self-expression, they have denied to Soviet society the means to express and to examine itself. Thus, the moral critique of Stalinism has never been some grunt of moral autonomy. It has been a very specific and practical political critique. It has concerned particular forms and practices with the international communist movement. The subordination of the imagination and of the artist to the wisdom of the party, the imposition of a notion of political realism, which refuses any debate over values at every level of the party organization. The economistic strategies and the narrow propaganda of material need, which is blind to whole areas of sexual cultural need, which despises the people's own cultural resources and which assumes but does not permit people to choose what they really want. As a result, in its inhibition of all utopianism and in its repression of the education of desire, it reproduces within capitalism the very reasons of capital, the utilitarian definition of need, and hence, in the very moment that it offers to struggle against its power, it inculcates obedience to its rules. Theoretical practice and its spurious pretensions to be science is seeking to validate the bad faith of the Marxist tradition and is reproducing as ideology the central vacancy of Stalinism. It was the oldest error of rationalism to suppose that by defining the non-rational out of its vocabulary, it had in some way defined it out of life. I rediscovered this with a happy sense of recognition in a recent debate on moralism in the pages of radical philosophy. The practitioners who as yet are only apprentices to theory should not be scolded too much, but we move here with solemnity through three propositions. One, all morality equals ideology. Thus for Marx, morality was an historically specific ideological institution functioning to mystify and discipline people in accordance with the oppressive and exploitive needs of class society. Marx certainly never said that insofar as he afforded license for some of that to be said. One can only say, alas, and recall how far his contemporary thought was saturated with the same rationalist illusions. But the equation is derived not only from Marx, but from historical materialism, whose products these authors have evidently found it necessary to consult. Marx's history, it seems, has demonstrated that moral ideology has a socially repressive function. Proposition 2. In contradistinction to moral ideology, which the ruling class inculcates for its own convenience, we are to suppose that a form of practical reason is possible, which is in no sense moral or socially repressive. Moral ideology must be antagonistic to natural values, happiness, the satisfaction of wants. Thus, there are naturalistic imperatives, simple ones like happiness, and these can be instantly deduced by reason. The removal of moral motives would leave man to rationally pursue his naturalistic ends. This apart from leaving the reason inside a split infinite, infinitive would leave no other problems. Practical reason of a non-moral kind involves understanding one's own needs, developing them in such a way that their most satisfying form of satisfaction is possible gaining knowledge and therefore power over the world, selecting the best means for the satisfaction of needs, etc. But a shadow passes across the sunlit field at the recollection of the possible egotism of other people, which might interfere with one satisfying one's needs satisfactorily. This practical reason must often be in the collective mode, i.e. the question will be not, what shall I do, but, shall, but what shall we do? collective naturalistic self-interest being the ground for choice. Our learned Themen, having disposed of this problem to his satisfaction, passes forward to pro Proposition 3. A classless society will see the withering way of all morality. The elimination of moral ideology is taken as a rational desideratum. The classical position of Marxism on this subject is that morality as an autonomous form of practical reason would disappear with the abolition of class antagonisms. Moreover, we can hasten that about living naturalistically now. 
There is no moral basis for socialism, no such thing as living as a socialist within a capitalist society, and no imperatives incumbent upon socialists as such other than that of working for socialism. How a socialist gets his money or his kicks is politically irrelevant. Proposition 1. Morality equals ideology. 2. But there are naturalistic ends, a collective naturalistic self-interest, which can be determined by reason. 3. Classless society will ensure the withering way of morality with a writer as to present to, as to present a money and kicks which, it is fair to note, one or two fellow practitioners disputed. The rest, it seems, should be taken as the classical position of Marxism's morality, a repressive mechanism for inhibiting the naturalistic libido. O reason, not the need. One might be pardoned for supposing that some apprentice practitioners have no more notion of the social formation and clash of values that, that might be afforded by recollections of nasty school rules and even nastier family quarrels. The ideological state apparatus of the, only, of the only family that ever appears in their writing is indeed hideously repressive. In the monogamous nuclear family, however liberal the child, however liberal, the child is at the mercy of her family, deprived of responsibility, determining agency, or choice of friends, and denied the opportunity for full, wide, and many-sided relationships with peers and older people. Thus are reinforced the isolated, anxiety-ridden, competitive character structures of the bourgeoisie, and as well the tamed, law-aspiring proletarian. The description is perhaps a touch moralistic, even priggish, and since Marxism, or Althusser, has demonstrated that the notion of responsibility determining agency in adults is a noxious humanist illusion, how is it that children do not come within the same theoretical provision? Never mind. The quarrels, one might hazard, have been about such naturalistic ends as sex, money, and pot. And this reminds us that the repudiation of all moralism has been very much the mode for some time. The revolting young bourgeoisie have long been into doing their own things. And if they are moralists at all, this comes out in their disapproval of all heavy speeches from their elders about oughts. The more sensitive among them have not only been into doing their own thing, they are already coming out, chastened at the thing's other side. They have discovered that to have the most satisfying form of satisfaction sometimes leaves the source of satisfaction as a heartbroken wreck, that egos must be socialized and humanized or sat upon if they are not to make each other's lives into a hell, that happiness does not come like a dog to the whistle of reason, that socialists who get their money and kicks in certain ways will also be somewhere else in any political emergency and that even those monstrous apparatuses, the family and school, have one or two functions subsidiary to that of repression. So some of these revolting young bourgeois are doing okay. They may yet take their parts in the socialist movement, while the others, the egotists who posture as revolutionaries, as one of their kicks, will no doubt graduate as vigilant headmasters and tyrannical papas. I've seen all this not only in my own empiricist experience, but also repeatedly in historical research. Very soon, the best of them will turn away from exclusive moral scrutiny of their own interpersonal affairs and take a larger view of society. And there they will discover the same logic writ out large. Getting knowledge and therefore power over the world will, for the unconstrained egotist, mean getting other people within his power. The reasons of reason, unencumbered by the moral consciousness, become very soon the reasons of interest, and then the reasons of state, and thence, in an uncontested progression, the rationalizations of opportunism, brutality, and crime. There is not, nor can there ever be, any naturalistic morality, any naturalistic ends. Certainly, historical and cultural materialism have never found them. Ends are chosen by our culture, which afford us, at the same time, our own medium of choosing and of influencing that choice. To suppose otherwise is to suppose that our needs are there, somewhere outside of ourselves and our culture, and that if only ideology would go. And this, of course, is the mom moment of recognition, for we have gone back in one swift step to one of the doughtiest moments in the Enlightenment. The naturalistic ends were given in a rational way as self-interest by Adam Smith, but it was left to Bentham to invent a means of determining these needs, 
in such a way that their most satisfying form of satisfaction is possible. The philosophic calculus and the notion of the collective naturalistic self-interest was proposed in a rational way by Rousseau and others. The general will, the common good, but it was left to William Godwin to ascend by the spiral of Hartleyan associationist psychology from self-interest to, benevol to benevolence from which lofty height the enthroned reason could see through all the spurious ideological bonds of sentiment, gratitude, love of kin, the family, the servitude of the irrational crowd. This was the time when all things tending fast to, dep to deprivation, the philosophy that promised to abstract the hopes of man out of his feelings, to be fixed thenceforth forever in a pure element found ready welcome, tempting region that for zeal to enter and refresh herself, where passions had the privilege to work, and never hear the sound of their own names. But speaking more in charity, the dream was flattering to the young ingen ingenious mind, pleased with extremes and not the least with that which make the human reason's naked self the object of its fervor. What delight, how glorious in self-knowledge and self-rule to look through all the frailties of the world, and with resolute mastery shaking off the accidents of nature, time, and place that make up the weak being of the past, builds social freedom on its only basis, the freedom of the individual mind, which to the blind restraints of general laws superior, magisterially adopts one guide, the light of, of circumstances flashed upon an independent intellect. This great passage from a great work, the prelude, reminds us that the mind has, has walked these cliffs before. It is itself, when taken in its full context, exemplary of that argument of values, that disciplined discourse of the proof to which I have referred. Marxism also has offered often to abstract the hopes of man out of his feelings and to fix them in the pure element of science. And Stalinism was the empire and theoretical practice is the vocabulary, with moralism, humanism, and human agency expelled from it in ignom ignominy where passions had the privilege to work and never hear the sound of their own names. And Godwinism itself, which freaked out half the young intelligentsia in England between 1794 and 1798, was exactly such a moment of intellectual extremism, divorced from correlative action or actual social commitment, as we have seen in the last decade. So if we shift a digit around 1798-1978, we are in the same synchronic moment of structured time. But the second time as farce for those Godwinians in the only moment when the English intelligentsia adopted in their theory an ultra-Jacobin posture had some spirit about them. They questioned everything, they questioned reason itself, seconded by Wollstonecraft, who came less from a rationalist than from a dissenting and romantic tradition, they made the institution of marriage spin. They frightened everyone. They frightened above all themselves. Theoretical practice, however, can lay claim to only one achievement in this country. It has frightened Mr. Julius Gold, who in such matters is well known to be an uncommonly uncom nervous fellow. For the rest, it has been a diversion, a retreat into the privacy of a complacent internal discourse, a disengagement from the actual political and intellectual contests of our time. As for the Godwinian moment and its tragic aftermath, I hope to tell that story another time. 16? 16. We left our post-Stalinist reader many pages back inquiring, well, did you identify the sources of Stalinism? Did you construct a better theory? I hope that the answer to both questions has now become clear. Stalinism appeared to us in those old days less as a coherent theoretical system than as a mishmash of repressive practices, dominative modes, hypocritical rhetoric, wrong theories, Leninist forms and tactics derived from the necessities of illegal agitation and turned into universalist axioms. And all this bound together within the short-sighted opportunism of the reasons of Soviet state power. Stalinism as high theory did not proceed 
but followed after the fact. If we wish to translate its practices in it, into a consistent theoretical system, then we would design a theory in which those empirical analysis of its practices was, as a matter of epistemological principle, disallowed empiricism, in which one moral critique was utterly prohibited, moralism, in which the universal validity of Leninist forms, but of forms in an advanced state of bureaucratic degeneration, was assumed without examination. The characteristic theoretical short circuit, the proletariat equals the party, in which a structuralist reductionism both guaranteed the fundamental health of the Soviet system and its supposedly socialist economic basis, thereby displacing all political, legal, and cultural questions into secondary or tertiary areas and disallowed any materialist historical analysis of the system, historicism, in which men and women were seen as the bearers of ineluctable structural determinations, in which their responsibility and historical agency was denied, humanism, and in which it was hence more easy to view them as rotten elements or things, and all this united within a notion of theory both as enclosure and as science, which theory would be grasped in its essential in its essentials by the rigorous contemplation of texts written over 100 years before the major historical experiences which it seeks to explain took place. In short, Althusserianism is Stalinism reduced to the paradigm of theory. It is Stalinism at last theorized as ideology. Thus, there is a sense in which we failed fully to identify Stalinism as theory because we were waiting upon Althusser for this theory to be invented. But we did, at least, identify essential components of this theory in its characteristic idealist mode of thought, and we never comforted ourselves with the apology that Stalinism represented only some unaccountable rupture of theory and practice. Moreover, we saw very clearly that from its particular matrix in Soviet history, Stalinism had entered deeply within the theory, practices, strategies, and forms of the international communist movement and further that the complicity of orthodox Marxism in funding Stalinism with its vocabulary of apologetics and proving itself to be pliant enough to provide the elements for the state ideology of the Soviet bureaucracy entailed the strong probability that Marxism itself stood in need of radical scrutiny and that it would never be adequate to ravel it up again into a better system. This gave us an agenda and it is hardly surprising that this agenda could not be completed in six or seven years years of heightened political activity. This also gives an answer to the second question. It was exactly the notion of Marxism as a self-sufficient theoretical sum which continued the essence of the metaphysical heresy against reason and which inhibited the active investigation of the world within the developing, provisional, and self-critical tradition of historical materialism. I have argued this sufficiently. Althusserianism is only one sophisticated form of a number of Marxisms, which pushed our unfinished agenda aside and crowded into the minds of a section of the Western intelligentsia from the 1960s onwards. The case of Althusserianism is one of the simplest since, as we have seen, it is a straightforward ideological police action. It constructs a theory which ensures not only that radical questions about Stalinism, communist forms, and Marxism itself are not asked, but that they cannot be asked. If we take Althusser at his own self-evaluation, if we suppose him to be innocent, then we can only say that he has lost himself so far inside his own head that when he looks at the world, he sees only the projection of his own concepts. The PCF is embodied proletarian ideology. Stalinism in decomposition is socialist humanism. The murder of a revolution's cadres is the dictatorship of the proletariat. The substantial gains over decades of the Western working classes are an index in their more intense exploitation. In a certain sense, we can be charitable. There's a logic in all this. Mechanical materialism, economism must, when every evidence from the real world disproves its theories, when every socialist expectation is abjectly falsified, stop up its ears and eyes and pass abruptly into the delirium of idealism. Not all the Marxisms have been of this wholly reactionary order. There have 
also been various Maoisms, Trotskyisms, and innumerable Marxist academicisms. Most of these share, however, the same religious case of thought in which a Marxism is proposed as an ultimate system of truth. That is, a theology. All seek to put Marx back into the prison of Marxism. Why there should have been this epistemological break from rationality to idealism, this rejection of the beginnings made in the 1950s and early 1960s, this reversion to an inner world of magical incantation and exalted theoretical illusion, this stealing off of the empirical senses, this self-closure of a tradition, this is a different problem, a problem of ideology and of the sociology of ideas which would require a distinct and extended treatment. I can now offer a few suggestions only. Althusserianism is only one extreme form, and perhaps a passing form, of a general malaise, not of theory only, but of the political presence of today's socialist movement. In marking off its characteristics as ideology, I intend to mark also certain features which it shares with other Marxisms of closure. The ideology has arisen and been replicated not in the Soviet Union, but within an advanced intellectual culture in the West. Its characteristic location has been in universities and other educational institutions, and for other reasons, by a sharp division between theory and practice. The radicalization of intellectuals within these institutions is often a somewhat enclosed and autonomous process, with no direct correlation with other sectors of society. So far from all communist parties providing this missing correlation, certain of these, for example, the PCF, directly express in their organizational forms another kind of severance of theory from practice. The higher echelons of the party apparatus are possessed of the science, which guides the militants of the base. The party intellectuals are often further segregated, both within Paris, the, intelli the intelligentsia's provincial ghetto, and within their own university branch. Thus we commence with a de facto sociological and intellectual segregation of theory and practice. And for larger political reasons, the kind of experience of mass political activity in which intellectuals have played a minority <clears throat> and a subordinate, sometimes overly subordinate part alongside comrades of diverse experience, and in particular alongside comrades with practical positions of leadership within their own communities, and places of work. This kind of experience has largely passed them by. <clears throat> there has been no experience of anti-fascist struggle, war, and resistance. Not even any consistent and hard-fought prag prag programmatic or electoral struggle which intellectuals could bear to support. <clears throat> May 1968 was over in a matter of days. Such industrial struggles as the British miners' strike, which brought a government down, were accomplished without the necessity of any intellectual participation. Of course, here and there, real struggles have flared up, and some comrades have gained authentic experience in the intense inner life of this or that sect. But in general, it may be said that there, was, there has never been a generation of socialist intellectuals in the West with less experience of practical struggle with less sense of the initiatives thrown up in mass movements, with less sense of what the intellectual can learn from men and women of practical experience, and of the proper dues of humility which the intellect must owe to this. This is to say that today's Western leftist intelligentsia is distinguished by its lack of political experience and judgment. But this is not offered in any sense as an accusation of sin. It is a necessary consequence of the determinations of our time. We cannot, remedy, we cannot remedy it by wishing it was otherwise, but it provides nevertheless the necessary ground within which the ideological deformations of our time are nurtured. Isolated within intellectual enclaves, the drama of theoretical practice may become a, a substitute for more difficult practical engagements. Moreover, this drama can assume increasingly theatr theatrical forms, a matter of grimaces and attitudinizing, a game of chicken in which each theorist strives to be more revolutionary than thou. Since no political relations are involved and no steady, enduring struggle to communicate with and learn from a public which judges cautiously by actions rather than professions, 
the presses may reek with ideological terror and blood. Moreover, this is precisely the ground which can nurture an elitism for which intellectuals, by a multitude of precedents, are only too well prepared. A generation indoctrinated by selective educational procedures to believe that their own specialized talents are a guarantee of superior worth and wisdom are only too willing to accept the role offered to them by Althusser. It is easy for them to posture as a very specific type of militant intellectual, a type unprecedented in many respects. Quote by Althusser, these are real initiatives armed with the most authentic scientific and theoretical culture, forewarned of the crushing reality and manifold mechanisms of all forms of the ruling ideology and constantly on the watch for them, enable in their theoretical practice to borrow against the stream of all accepted truths, the fertile paths opened up by Marx and barred by all the reigning prejudices." End quote. The Althusser should also predicate an un an unshakable and lucid confidence as the working class and direct participation in its struggles can be easily met, either by taking out a party card or by hypothesizing an ideal working class, for the present one is mystified into a false consciousness, which will, which will be engendered in the image of theory. For, as Althusser insists, Marx's theory is produced by a specific theoretical practice outside the proletariat and Marx's theory must be imported into the proletariat. Indeed, his whole account of Marx's epistemological break proposed that theory was prior to and independent of the working class movement's own self-discovery, and that ever since that movement has been acting out, however inefficiently, theory's script. What is so obvious is that this new elitism stands as direct successor in the old lineage, Benthamism, Coleridgean, Clarice, Fabianism, and Levisism Le Le <laughs> of the more American variety. Once again, the intellectuals, a chosen band of these, have been given the task of enlightening the people. There is no mark. There is no mark more distinctive of Western Marxisms, nor more revealing as to their profoundly anti-democratic premises. Whether Frankfurt, whether Frankfurt School or Althusser. They are marked by their heavy, their very heavy emphasis upon the ineluctable weight of ideological modes of domination, domination which destroys every space for the initiative or creativity of the mass of the people, a domination from which only the enlightened minority of intellectuals can struggle free. No doubt this ideological predisposition was itself nurtured within the terrible experiences of fascism, a mass indoctrination by the media, and of Stalinism itself. But it is a sad premise from which socialist theory should start. All men and women, except for us, are originally stupid. And one which is bound to lead on to pessimistic or authoritarian conclusions. Moreover, it is likely to reinforce the intellectual's disinclination to extend himself in practical political activity. To be sure, the ideal proletariat may, in this or that critical conjuncture, suddenly shift itself like a geological fault into a revolutionary posture when it will be ready to receive the ministrations of theory. Meanwhile, why bother to try to communicate, to educate, agitate, and organize, since the reason is powerless to penetrate the mists of ideology? In this way, a revolutionary Marxist critique which despairs of communication and which is only a fictional political correlative and which, moreover, reveals that all social evils are insoluble within capitalism, ends up as the ideological husk of passivity, in which the proclaimed need for revolution becomes a license for intellectual withdrawal. In this way, as Enzinsberger has warned, Marxist theory can become a false consciousness, if instead of being used for the method methodical investigation of reality through theory and practice, it is misused as a defense against that very reality. Those who wish to, to deprive Marxism of its critical subversive power and turn it into an affirmative doctrine generally dig in behind a series of stereotyped statements which, in their abstraction, are as irrefutable as they are devoid of results. Althusserian theory has been perfectly adapted to this function and designed for exactly this elitist intellectual couche. 
In particular, it allows the aspirant academic to engage in harmless revolutionary psychodrama, while at the same time pursuing a reputable and conventional intellectual career. As we have seen, every central theoretical position of Althusser is heavily derivative from orthodox bourgeois positions, an epistemology, structuralist sociology, etc. The dwarfing of human initiatives by ideologies and things is entirely consonant with the dominant common sense of conservative disciplines. Moreover, as political theory, because of the denial of experience and the repudiation of empirical controls, the practice can lead to anything and justify everything. In any conjuncture, a political or ideological instance can be hypothesized as dominant, and the kangaroo factor will carry it blithely from one prejudice to the next. If this is all that Althusserianism is an ideo as ideology, if it is no more than one of the successive fashions by which the revolting Western intelligentsia can do their thing without practical pain, then we have been wasting our time. But it is more serious than that. It is actively reinforcing and reproducing the effective passivity before a structure, which holds us all prisoners. It is enforcing the rupture between theory and practice. It is diverting good minds from active theoretical engagement and at a level of more vulgar political discourse. It affords theoretical legitimations for all the stupidest and most dangerous half-truths, which one had supposed had at last gone away. That morality equals the interests of the working class, that philosophy equals class struggle, that democratic rights and practices equals liberal ideology, and so on. Such a theory, if ever afforded any power so far from liberating the working class, would, in its insufferable arrogance, and pretensions to science, deliver them into the hands of a bureaucratic clerisy, the next ruling class waiting on the line. This outcome seems unlikely. Most of those who have fallen under Althusserian influence are not cut out to be Stalinist priests. They are simply young men and women who would like to be socialist revolutionaries, who have now found a medium of practical engagement and hence have been taken for a ride. The terminus of that ride is outside the city of human endeavor and outside the domain of knowledge. So we can expect them to be absent from both. And yet at the same time, we should not forget that this theory is affording comfort and arguments to the most conservative elements within the most conservative communist apparatuses. Like all ideologies, this one confirms the situation out of which it arose. In strengthening the extreme right wing of the left, it reproduces that inertia and that paralysis of the socialist will, which was its own precondition of existence. I cannot say whether theoretical practice is being taken up within the state orthodoxies of the Soviet Union and of Eastern Europe. It is, I suspect, both too sophisticated and too undisguisedly Stalinist for that. After all, if Stalin were alive today, he would be the first to recognize that Stalin committed errors. The ultimate dream of theoretical practice is the resuscitation of the duality of temporal and spiritual powers in medieval Christendom. The holy proletarian emperor will make his pilgrimage to theory's abode, where after due interrogation in the doctrine he will be crowned. This is not likely to come about, but a more somber and more conceivable scenario comes to mind when one, con when one contemplates the situation in certain countries in the third world. For Althusserianism is rather exactly tailored to the ideological requirements of an aspirant ruling class, the next ruling class to be, in societies where a section of the intelligentsia, greatly distanced from the masses, adopts policies which demand ruthless modernization, Marxist and anti-imperialist rhetoric, contempt for democratic practices, and effective reliance on the economic and military protection of the Soviet state. If one considers for a moment the possible consequences of the Communist Party of India, one of the most unreconstructed un Stalinist parties in the world, were to reinforce its existing anti-libertarian tendencies and contempt for the petty bourgeois masses, tendencies amply displayed in its partnership in the recent emergency with a dose of Althusserian arrogance, and if its largely bourgeois and intellectual upper cadres were to become theoretical practitioners, and if the opportunity to practice not only in theory but upon the body of India should return, then we could expect nothing less than the reenactment of the full repertoire of a high Stalinism within the raging inferno of Indian scarcity. 
but we may leave this to the good sense of our comrades in India or Latin America who face every day problems more palpable and more exacting than our own. We cannot pretend to draw the blinds upon experience or to place their theory here and there, practice over there. All the same, it would be good to talk about it and to exchange experiences on the political problems which we have in common. It would be good if the authentic international dialogue of lib libertarian communism would be resumed. 17. I will conclude, as is now obligatory, with an auto-critique. Five years ago, in my open letter to Lezek Kolakowski, I discussed several meanings of contemporary Marxisms and concluded with a general notion of Marxism as tradition. Within this tradition, I saw an immense variety of discourse and quite incompatible sub-traditions. But nevertheless, I argued that, uncomfortable as such cohabitation may be, all were united in the sense of employing a common vocabulary of concepts, many of which derived from Engels and from Marx. I suggested that one must be resigned to the strenuous activity of continually defining one's position within this tradition, and that the only alternative was that of evacuating this tradition altogether, a choice which I refused. I preferred to remain within that tradition, even if some few of us remained only as outlaws. I can now see that this was an inadequate and evasive resolution. Politically, it has long been impossible for the Stalinist and anti-Stalinist positions to cohabit with each other. It is clear to me now from my examination of Althusserianism and my implicit critique of other related Marxisms that we can no longer attach any theoretical meaning to the notion of a common tradition. For the gulf that has opened has not been between different accentuations to the vocabulary of concepts, between this analogy and that category, but between idealist and materialist modes of thought, between Marxism as closure and a tradition, derivative from Marx, of open investigation and critique. The first is a tradition of theology. The second is a tradition of active reason. Both can derive some license from Marx, although the second has immeasurably the better credentials as to its lineage. I must therefore state without equivocation that I can no longer speak of a single common Marxist tradition. There are two traditions whose bifurcation and disengagement from each other has been slow, and whose final declaration of irreconcilable antagonism was delayed as an historical event until 1956. From this point forward, it has been necessary both within politics and within theory to declare one's allegiance to one or the other. Between theology and reason, there can be no room left for negotiation. Libertarian communism and the socialist and labor movement in general can have no business with theoretical practice expect, except to expose it and drive it out. If I thought that Althusserianism was the logical terminus of Marxist thought, then I could never be a Marxist. I would rather be a Christian or hope to have the courage of a certain kind of Christian radical. At least I would then be given it back a vocabulary within which value choices are allowed and which permits the defense of the human personality against the invasions of the unholy capitalist or holy proletarian state. And if my disbelief, as well as my distaste for churches, disallowed this course, then I would have to settle for being an empirical, liberal, moralistic humanist. But I refuse these spurious choices which theoretical practice and allied Marxisms seek to impose. And instead I declare unrelenting intellectual war against such Marxisms. And I do so from within a tradition, one of whose major founders was Marx. There is a certain cant which has long been about, which seeks to avoid this engagement under the slogan, no enemies to the left. That slogan had a necessary and honor honorable origin in the emergencies of anti-fascist re resistance. And in political terms, such emergencies will often recur. But how is it possible to say that there are no such enemies after the experience of high Stalinism after Budapest 1956, after Prague 1968. And within theory, what possible meaning is attached to the left when it teaches lessons of anti-moralism, anti-humanism, and the closure of all the empirical apertures of reason? Could Marx or Morris or Mann have recognized any of the theory or practice of Stalinism and acknowledged these as having even a national relation to the left, or sorry, a notional relation to the left? 
Just the suppression of reason and the obliteration of the imagination have any place on the left? Does the confiscation by an all-knowing substitutionist party or vanguard of the self-activity and means of self-expression and self-organization of the working people constitute the practice of a left? What the Kant slogan does is simply erect a moralistic defense around orthodox communist organization and practices Defenses supplemented by the ideological terrorism of Althusser, intended, intended to impress any socialist critic with a sense of guilt, a breach of solidarity. Hence, the status quo is inviolable. Any socialist critique is illicit or is evidence of malicious bourgeois or Trotskyite slander. And the only licit criticism must be within the slow and opportunistic procedures of the apparatus itself. Hence, the fight against Stalinism as theory and as practice must be left forever unresolved. And as a consequence, we are constructed into a space within which we commit daily breaches of solidarity with our comrades who are striving to dismantle Stalinism and who suffer under the reasons of communist power. And declaring war in this way and in asking that others declare themselves less equivocally, I do not make a simple equation. Stalinism equals all communist organizations and forms. I do not declare all communism to be infected and suffering a terminal illness. I do not reject necessary and clear-eyed political alliances with communist movements. I do not ignore the honorable and indeed democratic elements in the record of communist struggle in the West and in the Third World. I do not doubt the courage and commitment of communist cadres in a hundred anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist struggles. I do not confuse Stalinism as theory and as particular forms and practice with the historical and sociological existence of communist mass movements. I do not deny that within the turn towards Euro-communism, genuine struggles over principle are involved, as well as opportunist adjustments to an electorate. I do not refuse to note the genuine concern and the public registration of this concern at aspects of Soviet reality which have been increasingly evident within Euro-communism since the time of Prague 1968. I do not dismiss all this as hypocrisy. It is a welcome and important indication of an ulterior shift, often imposed upon the leadership by their own militant base. After or above all, I expect in the coming decades fresh reinforcements for the war against Stalinism to arise, whether East or West, from within the communist movements themselves. How these struggles will eventuate, and with what differences in Poland, Spain, or Bengal, is a historical question as to which theory would be foolish to predict. What I mean is rather this, first libertarian communism, or socialism which is both democratic and revolutionary in its means, its strategy and objectives must stand firmly on an independent base, base on its own feet, developing its own theoretical critique and increasingly its own political forms and practices. Only on these presuppositions can any alliance be negotiated, and if emergencies demand such an alliance, then it cannot be in orthodox communism's usual imperative terms that ulterior theoretical and strategic differences be obscured or silenced in the interests of a broad left, whose interests are in turn ultimately those of the party. Second, the conditions for any common action must be a continuing and unequivocal critique of every aspect of the Stalinist legacy. Until the agenda of 1956 is completed, down to the last item of any other business, any pretenses as to the self-reform of Euro-communism can rest only on the insecure pledges of electoral opportunism. The struggle must irradiate every level of theory and of practice, leading to radical changes in the forms of communist party organization and in the practical relations of communists with other socialist bodies and with their own constituencies. And only on these preconditions that common action accelerates such changes and discloses ulterior differences can our purposes be served. In Britain, with its, in Britain, with its small and declining Communist Party, these questions are of secondary importance. 
but equally the failure of the alternative libertarian tradition to enter that vacuum and establish itself as a political presence alongside the labor movement. This failure is the more serious and less explicable. In the much publicized revival of Marxism in Britain in the last two decades, a mountain of thought has not yet given birth to one political mouse. Enclosed within the intelligentsia's habitual elitism, the theorists disdain to enter into any kind of relation with a labor movement, which they know on a priori grounds to be reformist and corporative, whose struggles created the institutions in which they are employed, whose labor made the chairs in which they sit, which manages to exist and to reproduce itself without them, and whose defensive pressures are all that stand between them and the reasons of capitalist power. Nor have these theorists created any independent agencies of political communication and education. The only agencies created are journals in which they can converse with each other. But this is to raise a new range of political questions to be discussed on some other day. I may sound more bitter than I am. I think there is indeed much energy and ability inside those barrels of enclosed Marxisms which stand row upon row in the corridors of polytechnics and universities. By striking a sharp and bitter blow at the Althusserian bungs, I hope I may let a little of that energy get out. If it should do so, then the problems of creating in this country an independent left, engaged in a continual and fraternal dialogue of practice with a large labor movement, might not prove to be insuperable after all. Those massive and impassive structures of our time might prove to be more vulnerable to human agencies than the Marxisms suppose. And if any minds should get out, I hope they will bring Marx with them. I hope they will not bring only Marx. And they must certainly rid themselves of the truly scholastic notion that the problems of our time and the experiences of our century will become understood by the rigorous scrutiny of a text published 120 years ago. To return in every motion of analysis to propositions of Marx is like going on a cross-country run in leaden boots. William Morris expressed the matter with unerring sanity. Tough as the job is, you ought to read Marx, he advised a correspondent. Up to date, he is the only completely scientific economist on our side. As the assembled ranks of Marxists express their sense of scandal or dissolve into laughter, I will continue my argument. It is not on the question of whether or not it is adequate to describe Marx as an economist. This was the Marx available to Morris, and one might add, it is the Marx to which the man is reduced, in effect, by mode of production manipulators and by capital naval scrutinizing groups. The point is that Marx is on our side. We are not on the side of Marx. His is a voice whose power will never be silenced. But it has never been the only voice, and its discourse does not have limitless range. He did not invent the socialist movement, nor did socialist thought in some way fall into his sole possession or that of his legitimate heirs. He had little to say by choice as to socialist objectives, as to which Morris and others said more, and more that is pertinent today. In saying this little, he forgot and at times appeared to deny that not only socialism, but any future made by men and women rests not only upon science or upon the determinations of necessity, but also upon choices of values and the struggles to give these choices effect. The choice which faces the Marxist tradition today and which has long faced it is that between idealist rationalism and the operative and active reason. As for the Althusserians, they have long made that choice and retired to the rituals of their own secluded observatory. As if an astronomical observatory should be made without any windows, and the astronomer within should arrange the starry universe solely by pen, ink, and paper, so Mr. Althusser, in his observatory, and there are many like it, had no need to cast an eye upon the teeming myriads of human beings around him, but could settle all their destinies on a slate and wipe out all their tears with one dirty li little bit of sponge. Maybe this observatory is already collapsing upon its rotten foundations, but other more fashionable, more avant-garde observatories will be erected around its ruins before they are enclosed within some more well-appointed Marxism, I ask my readers able also to choose. 
I have now, on three occasions, beaten the bounds of 1956. No doubt my critics are right. The return to that moment in the past has been with me obsessional. There have been few confessions of fossilization as sad as this. At each defeat, one should pick oneself up, brush the dust off one's knees, and march cheerily on with one head, one's head into the air. But what if the defeat be total and abject, and call in question the rationality and good faith of the socialist project itself? And what if the protagonists within the socialist movement finally disengage at that point, and their absolute antagonism becomes declared? Can one then go on, head even higher in the air, just as before? I do not think so, but I promise not to mention the matter again. My dues to 1956 have now been paid in full. I may now, with a better conscience, return to my proper work and to my own garden. I will watch how things grow.